OTB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition available now. Right, a very good morning to you. Welcome along. It is the 20th of June and we beat the uh, Gibraltar 3-0 last night. So if you are uh, interested, we'd like to hear from you this morning. 0 is the WhatsApp number. We've plenty more on the show, including our first depth chart of the Rugby World Cup season and uh, more reaction to the news that the Camogie players and the Gaelic footballers are playing the rest of the season under protest. We'll get to all that a little bit later. Uh, first though, Keith Tracy's here. Good morning to you, Keith. How are you? Uh, morning. Not too bad. Not Adrian, too bad at all. Adrian Barry's here. Morning, folks. Uh, Colm is also here. Colm, how are you? Hi, Dar. A routine 3 0 win. Uh, everybody beats Gibraltar 3 0, uh, said John Fallon on the show. And lo and behold, he was correct. Uh, how do we feel after this? Not great. Like it's, uh, when, we, when we drew with France, or sorry, when we got beat 1 0 by France, we came away thinking that's not a bad result given the quality of the, the opposition we were up against, given the quality of the opposition we were up against last night not great probably took a bit too long to come the first half was very very forgettable I know that within the first 30 seconds Jamie McGrath has a good a good strike at the, the penalty spot great start but we just didn't build on it and we didn't turn the screw enough we just didn't put them under enough pressure second half was an awful lot better but again because of the, the level of opposition we're up against not a lot really to write home about there um, I think the difficulty after a game like last night where there's lots to be happy about uh and you know the rest of the world has also struggled to beat them 3-0 is that it comes as a pair with the Greece game that's the problem we can't suddenly forget that the Greece game happened yeah the Greece game was was the one you know we, we should be just brushing Gibraltar aside uh, we want to try and finish third in the group which means we need to get ahead of, of Greece having seen what Greece have to offer on Friday and what we have to offer I, I don't really fancy our chances and then you know people are down kicking it down the road and saying well maybe we could beat Holland and you're thinking Come on, lads, we can't even play well against Greece. And I know the Dutch side on, on the eye, they haven't been great. Watching them, they haven't been great. But when you look at that side on paper, they're very, very good. And to think that we're going to be able to go toe-to-toe with them, I, I, I really don't see it. So, look, last night was was exactly what we needed, exactly what we wanted. But, you know, it, it still doesn't leave a, a good taste in the mouth that the Friday night, uh, the Friday night is where all of the damage was done. Yeah, and yes, right. Uh, not to sound like a complete moron the uh, the best performances that we've had under Stephen Kenny have come against the good teams against Portugal against France like I would expect us to be way more competitive and way sharper in September uh, when everybody knows that their job is to defend for 90 minutes against France in Paris and then basically to defend for 87 minutes against the Dutch in Dublin and then for the last five minutes to you know try is that the um uh, Steve Staunton we don't play well in June was what was it what was it he said that time we don't no. we never play well in well, whatever it was we might play better in, so I think there's I think there's we're strong in March that, yeah. I, think I think there's we're always strong in March I do think the point about like if Friday had gone slightly differently for us if we'd gotten something out of that game at all that there isn't the, the, you mentioned the 3-0 par for the course results that all the other teams so far against Gibraltar have managed the exact same result all of them I think were ahead at half time suggesting a little bit more comfort in the performance wow. we we, we yeah. stat boy over here What's your amazing stat? Unbelievable. Uh, only once before mm. have Gibraltar held the opposition to a goal a straw at half time in a qualifier. Keith, what was the opposition? No Very idea. close to home. Ireland 2019. Really? Yeah. So you're looking 51 and a half minutes on the clock. I'd actually put it to both E at the stadium. Was there murmurs going around? Was there a lot of. Jesus, this could actually... Well, there was booze at half time. Was, I was yeah. trying to sort of quantify exactly what it was at that time. They didn't go on particularly long. It felt like a kind of a guttural frustration as much as anything else. I, I, you, you can read an awful lot into like fans booing at a stadium, but it felt like a guttural kind of frustration at the fact that we had had a couple of chances. Like if Jamie McGrath buries that on 30 seconds... As, uh, that sums up know. the Stephen Kenny Rain for me. It's like he puts that in. 
less it's a different game. Could less than a minute gone, and you're like, well, it's procession, yeah. and that sounds easy, okay, if you if you put the chances in, obviously. But like to create that chance it was good play, like Jason Knight speeding down the right, beautiful pullback, and a good connection with the shot. Either side of the goalkeeper, it's a goal, and then suddenly you're like, this could be any score, just exactly what they need. That's that's Kenny's side, like in a nutshell. Yeah, but the, you need to be more ruthless when when the keeper saves that and we don't score. We need to get straight back on and keep them under the pressure, keep the torn, keep the screw torn, and keep like we know historically their defense is not great. They can see three goals on average most games so just keep putting the ball in the box eventually we'll get a chance off them these aren't world class defenders so you don't have to complicate the game they were in the middle of the pitch it was really really compact not an awful lot of space Obafemi couldn't do an awful lot because there wasn't room in behind him and Ferguson were coming to feet and it was just all getting a little bit muddled down in the middle of the pitch so mm. if they're going to give you the wide areas take them and just keep putting put decent quality into the box and eventually their coach will say lads we're going to have to stop these balls coming into the box they'll get a little bit tighter to you and that's when you can start doing little one twos but I thought the Mikey Johnson coming on was really really needed because we were playing around Gibraltar we weren't playing through them it was all pass 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 you needed somebody just to go and have a dribble at somebody and commit somebody and as soon as you commit somebody then you've broke their lines and there's a bit of chaos in their, in their formation now so I thought Mikey Johnson was a really I give Kenny a bit of credit for that because it's hard to see that from pitch level I was sitting up in the gods and it was fairly obvious yeah. that we didn't need the torch centre half so yeah. I give Stephen Kenny big uh, big credit for bringing on Mikey Johnson and it did it changed the game even though the fourth goal was a little bit fortuitous I had that free kick not have landed at Mikey Johnson's feet mm. would yeah. we have brought yeah, yeah. there would that came everyone seems to be in agreement that Mikey Johnson should have started the game is the only is the reason he didn't because Kenny has no intention of starting him against the likes of France and the Netherlands yeah, but I, I probably, but I don't accept that. You know, every every game is different. There's no point not. I'm not st- starting Mikey Johnson today against Gibraltar because we're playing Holland in a month's time. There's, what's the point in that? It's it's every game is different. You take every game on its merits to give a, a John Joyles quote. But you you do. We should be beating these teams. We should be able to go to a four three three against these and just beat them. Just push them away. Now, look, when the Dutch come here, we can go back to a five. We can make it horrible. And like you said, yeah, notoriously, when the bigger teams come here we do okay and I think that's because we're going out with the mindset with the mentality that we're going to suffer our possession here we're going to we're going to have to do an awful lot of running but within the 90 minutes we'll get Evan Ferguson a chance Before he became the Ireland manager Kenny was more a 4-3-3 like I remember before we went to three at the back talking with the, the League of Ireland fans uh, particularly Johnny Ward he's like there's no way Stephen Kenny's playing three at the back there's absolutely no he's never going to and then I think because we had uh, loads of good centre backs not many midfielders and not many attacking players at the time it was like this is a fairly obvious thing to do and probably Anthony Barry was involved in like oh look at look at where we are here look at the situation and we played really well um, was that was the f- was that the first game was the Portugal game was it when we went to three at the back anyway early doors yeah. um, and I wonder if he might be considering going back now and saying right like it's it's do or die time for him and his reign and actually going back to a four because we were really open at the very start when we, were, we had the four and the midfield wasn't strong enough to be able to protect them is there a possibility we actually abandon the three at the back now in the next window which let's face it is one of the most difficult windows that you can possibly have yeah look it's I, I personally I would prefer to see us playing a four at the back but then I'm starting to think if I'm an opposition analyst I'm thinking how can you get our Ireland if they're playing four at the back I don't think we have any any wing backs any left back any right back who's a decent 1v1 defender when you look at O'Dowd on Friday night he was absolutely shocking you look at Doherty on the right very good player but 1v1 situations you don't really trust them so all I think is we need to be able to defend better in 1v1 situations will he go back to a 4 I'm not too sure I think he has this blanket approach that I'm going to play 3 centre halves with 2 wing backs obviously didn't work for the fourth half last night and he changed it but I, I can't see him I, I think the 5 the 3 at the back whatever you want to call it I think will be his mainstay <coughs> going forward but I don't think that I don't generally think that's a, that suits us in an attacking sense I thought with the Obafemi Ferguson and uh, uh, Johnson when Johnson came on I thought the 3 up front actually did suit us a lot better but against the bigger nations I just think we're a little bit open with the 4-3-3 three, three. if you played 4-3-3 three, three, right just to indulge me for a minute who would the three in midfield be in that scenario so say you do have Obafemi Johnson and Ferguson as your three up front who are the three in midfield that we could in some way make that work I think 
I, I would put an awful lot of legs in there. I would tell our, uh, probably Cullen, Malumbi and Knight. I'd tell them just to go and get the ball. See, Knight, Knight, is it, Knight is probably the only one who could go and get involved with the attack and play. Malumbi and Cullen, for me, are a little bit similar. They'll go, they'll run around, they'll put all the work in the world and then win the ball back. But when they get it, they can't really hurt teams. Knight has a little bit of that about him. He can't hurt you. So I'd put them three in there and I'd give Knight the, Knight the license to go and be the link to the front three. But again, I, I I think we're a little bit too open. Like if we were playing France with that formation, I'm I'm concerned. Yeah, very very concerned. Um, but say it was it was Seamus Coleman at right back. Is that giving you a little bit more comfortable? I mean, obviously it would be Coleman versus Mbappe on on his own, really. Yeah, that's it. Well, you you, you would like and even a. Uh, uh, Kenny Cunningham was talking about this last night if he's playing right back he would prefer a right, uh, a right winger to come and just stand 10 yards in front of him and double up that way rather than playing a 5 at the back and being a 1v1 up against somebody so look it's it's horses for courses I think we can chop and change but I think we're very naive to say listen Ireland are going to play whatever formation X, Y and Z I think it has to change from game to game because we're not good enough to just throw a blanket on this and say we're playing a 3 at the back every game regardless of who we're playing yeah. I think we have to change every single game because we're not good enough just to say that's us and that's how we play Is that the only reason for you that he continued with a back three last night because we could all see it was kind of pointless basically like two of the three defenders were redundant Well I think the, the whole first half. but is he, is he doing that so is Nathan that he's Collins, going to keep it with France and the Dutch But is Nathan Collins not supposed to join in the midfield and, and, and it's, it, that's where you create your overload because like that should you should be able to play that if like Okay, it's a stupid comparison, but John Stones plays at centre back, but actually ends up in midfield, and that's what the model for three at the back against a team where you're dominating possession is that your your centre backs are adding extra. John Egan sometimes adds an extra, and all of a sudden it's two it's two on one, and that's what the overload is. We just weren't very good at it. No, we weren't very good at it. But look again, I I, I give Stephen Kenny he he spotted that he did make the change at, uh, at half time. He brought Mikey Johnson on, but you did want Collins to step in, and every now and then he did step in it and go in. But the middle of the pitch was so so congested that his first pass was just out to the winger, and then the winger would go engage with somebody, and then eventually come back, and we just end up passing around Gibraltar rather than through them. But like I said, it was a lot better in the second half when we gave it to Mikey Johnson. We isolated him, and I think he was under clear instructions just to run at defenders as soon as you get it run at defenders cause a bit of chaos and it worked in the end but I do I do think Colin I think you're right the reason he played the 3-5 to five at the back last night is because that's what he's going to play going forward I think there's an element as well of like we're obviously saying this morning he changed things at half time and that worked it was great it sort of changed the face of the game I think also if you watch back that first half like technically we were just off it at times, you know. Like the system was working fine, but there was a bad ball from Ferg- uh, Ferguson at one point. There was a bad uh, ball from Obafemi at another stage. Like technically, at times, the system was grand. Like I think any system against Gibraltar, you're relying technically on your players to be able to do it. And I, you know, I do think that we get carried away at times about is the manager got not good enough? Is it the manager or the players? Like there's probably a little bit of everything at play. Certainly looking at it last night, technically at times against that level of quality, we just weren't at it. Yeah, and look, I, I referenced it last night with, with Gibraltar going and dropping back into a really low block. Their their striker was so isolated. You know, you want to look at an isolated striker. Look at that fella last night. He he did barely had a kick of the ball. Was just running after shadows. But we we just we we kept playing around them. And with, with, when Mikey Johnson came on, it was an awful lot better. But it just tactically when Gibraltar dropped back into that low block, we kept the ball recycling around there centre halves we're taking two three touches bopping her into midfield Cullen with Tony take a touch take another touch and you're thinking this needs to be one and two touch we need invent the passing here and the tempo dropped an awful lot because Gibraltar tempos dropped our tempo seemed to drop and that can't be the case like I say we need to turn the screw te- keep the tempo high put them on the back foot get them moving from side to side an awful lot and when they came off it it felt like our tempo came off it and like I said it that can happen sometimes you feel like the game is a little bit stale and you just drop with it but you need then people just barking the likes of a comb barking at people yeah. to keep your standards high one touch two touch in the midfield it was just all a little bit pedestrian a little bit slow and yeah, it have just you, didn't wasn't there. Have you played in games like that? Like so, so Gibraltar playing that game last night. Eleven players behind the ball. I can only imagine the frustration of the players. Like it is hard. Yeah, well, you know, we don't talk too much about that. They're a very low ranked team. 
technically very bad mm. anytime they got the ball you felt oh, we're going to get this back now in about four seconds it'll be absolutely fine but at the same time they're sat behind the ball you know the the trying to get the ball wide trying to get it to the, the end line and get it back in was obviously the ambition but hard against that number of players have you been on the pitch before like that where you're like Jesus we're so much better than this crowd but yeah, look, it it always is, but you believe in you believe in the process, you believe in what's happening, and we've all been in games where look, it, it only takes a, a one decent ball into the box of defender to get half ahead, and there's somebody to arrive late or you know half a deflection. So as long as you put quality into the box, and I, I think it was Sam Allardyce that used to drill this into me. I think it's for every ten quality balls you put into the box, you'll get at least one shot on goal. So he used to always say to me, "I need at least ten decent balls into the box off you a game," and he would demand that from the winger. So if you send your wingers out. Out there and notoriously I think that's what Ireland are good at over the years getting the ball out wide and putting it into the box and modern day football now is all about don't let them play through us make them play around us if teams are going to let us do that then take advantage of it because we're notoriously good at it don't you know don't turn down the easy stuff in the overall scheme of things did Liam Brady have a point that this is the worst group of players in a long time yeah, look, I, 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 I've said this last night and I, I, I'm, a, I'm a lot younger than Liam Brady. I'm only 34, but this this is probably the worst Irish team on paper that I've seen. And I, I, I hate throwing that at them because I know quite a few of them personally and they, they try their socks off. They, it's not the one to try and it's really not, but I think it's it's a marriage that hasn't quite, quite worked too well. I think the manager has asked and certain players within the group to do things that they're not comfortable doing and maybe that they can't do so what kind of stuff are you t- talking about there because this is something that comes up it's like oh we can't play the way he wants us to play but uh, wh- what are we talking about there well look if you have say John Egan is on the ball any of our back lads are on the ball and you have Cullen coming towards it and somebody's breathing down his back are you is your heart not in your mouth thinking Cullen's going to be nicked here or Malumbi might lose the ball or even Nine might just get nicked here because the one, thing, the one thing I always say now in football is that if you press properly, you will get chances in the game just by your press. So if we can negate that and say we're not going to give anybody any easy chances, we're not going to play sideward passes, we're not going to play backward passes in our own half and just take that over say we're not going to give you that and you're going to have to earn everything. And my heart is just in my mouth a little bit when our players are trying to play at the back. And I, I don't know whether it was the first half or the, the second half last night. I think it was one of our centre halves tried a back heel in our own 18 yard box to the Dar O'Shea. Yeah. Dar O'Shea. And you, I, I know he's been injured. I know it's probably just a little bit of a mental relapse. But international football is 90 minutes long. And if you're coughing up little chances like that against Gibraltar, it just doesn't bode well for the bigger teams coming here. Is it mentally, uh, in your own experience, very difficult to play against? A side that that is that inferior to you, i.e., that like like Agent said uh, a while ago, there like every four seconds you're gonna get the ball back when they have it. So to keep to keep on going and going and going, like what type, what type of character do you need in that instance? And it kind of goes back to the overall quality of the squad. Yeah, you you need that little bit of quality. You need somebody to break them down, just that little bit of stardust. But that's when you need to take your own little res- personal responsibility. Like if I was playing on the on the wing last night and I got the ball, I'd be wanting to go and go and commit people, make a difference because the pass and the easy ozy stuff like Gibraltar for as bad as they were defensive shape actually wasn't that bad yeah. they, they were moving quite well so you need somebody to pierce the noise to penetrate it. It, you can't just pass around them and around them and just keep lumping it in every now and then you have to mix it up and think right he's going to run us and then as soon as Johnson gets the ball you can see the right winger thinking I'm going to go and have to help me right back here now we have an overload somewhere else on the pitch so it was it was decent but it's just a little bit lethargic for long long periods I've always assumed I was interested in hear your point there about uh, Cullen coming for the ball I'd always assumed the so we talk about the our ability to be able to play a bit of football how it's a bit easier on the eye than mm-hmm. watching the lump it up stuff and I've always just taken it for granted that the players that's just a given that they'd rather play that than play the lump it up stuff but you're actually saying maybe not well I, I don't know what the individuals think themselves but when I when I look at it and you know you, you're seeing us fire balls into the middle of the pitch in, into, into certain players m- my heart is in my mouth an awful lot of the time because I don't think we have very very good ball playing now they have they have good attributes Cullen's a brilliant player I love what he does for Burnley but his biggest attribute wouldn't be getting on the ball and, and you know playing these eye the needle passes or playing on the half turn it's about getting around the pitch breaking up the play winning the ball for us he's good at what he does but I don't, have we got a ball playing midfielder 
is there anybody you'd say just fire the ball into him or trust him on it every time he has it like a, a Wes, I, I hate throwing older names yeah. in because it gets it happens a lot but the, the nilk of a Wes who will hand just say give it to him he won't lose it mm. I thought we, Smallbone we don't was have poor that. last night but yeah. Smallbone against Greece I thought was absolutely disgraceful I thought he was really really poor but I thought that was a very poor decision from Stephen Kenny to put him in, put him in that, that was his yeah. debut yeah. his competitive debut Greece away that's, that's very very deep water to be throwing somebody in Gibraltar at home in a, in a qualifier totally different totally different thing but Greece away in the heat very very difficult <laughs> yeah like the thing with this Ireland side I look at it like we're very confident of passing the ball among ourselves at the back mm. with no pressure and then you go up to midfield it gets a little bit more pressurised and then it's almost like we're, we're dying to play ball but as soon as we get into the opposition's final third all sense of what we were trying to do goes out the window and I don't know if it goes back to the fact that the majority of our players are not playing top level football mm. or if it is a management issue so uh, yeah, th- to crystallise that basically if, if you were in charge of this team we'd be playing the ball back to front and pressing yeah but look it, 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 it would be back to front football but it would be that for you know, I'd be throwing a jab so we can land a punch. I wouldn't just be going out there saying, lads, regardless of what they do, I just want you to pump along. If they stand off us, then yeah, we would play through the towards. We would try and play nice, attractive football. But if a team comes and you go and press me high, can I, I would just clip uh, over that press. Can we just tease this out, right? Because you don't believe that we have the midfielders to do it. I don't think anybody is here going, well, hang on a second, look at them. It's so amazing. They've got hidden skills that we just haven't seen yet. Uh, that transmits to the players, right? And so you've been in the trap uh, that like these are not champions that's what he would say about you in mm. press conferences uh, to, to the Italian journalists we'd be sitting there going I mean he sees we're here right <laughs> <laughs> you know we've got ears we can listen to this but like what does that do for the team's confidence and are we then stuck because 25,000 would have been at that game last night yeah. if they hadn't bundled the tickets uh, but in the previous series we would have been lucky to get 20,000 and they would have lied to us and said there's 40,000 but there was, it felt like there probably was 35 to 40,000 at the game last night like we don't we're bored watching back to front football it was shy to watch under Martin O'Neill yeah look I get that but I, I remember is, there, is there no third way here is of course it's not listen if, if Stephen Kenny's not here then we have to go back to you know Sam Allardyce it's not a complete 360 here there is a hybrid way of playing and it's horses for courses if, if France come to town you can play over it if Gibraltar come to town we can try and be a little bit more uh, advanced and play, play through the tours but it, it, it to me the only time we look dangerous when you throw your, throw your like we can forget about Gibraltar we should be hammering the likes of Gibraltar so I'll go back to the Greece game on Friday the only time we scored well, the, the goal we scored was a set piece a flick on from Evan Ferguson and Nathan Collins in at the back Nathan Collins' uh, volley was a set piece that comes in and gets headed out and then he volleys it the only shots we had on target the only time we looked dangerous was when we put the ball into the box so all this attractive football people are saying oh, it has got better it's more it's, it's moving forward it's getting better I would argue, yeah, it, it probably has been a little bit better on the eye, but had we been a little bit more, a little bit more pragmatic, we'd have won a lot more games of football. Is there a case as well, just on that point, that like, so he spent the early part of his Ireland career, Stephen Kenny, trying to adapt this new system under a lot of pressure at that time, and the things that he was working with at that point in terms of forward options were Troy Parrott. Well, so obviously, at some point, was like the the this guy is going to be the one. Uh, Ogben may maybe in a forward position, Obafemi in a forward position. So they were his tools, mm. and then more laterally this genius comes into play who's seven foot eight and um, you know built like a whatever uh, and he's a very different option than what he had when he adapted this style of play also you've had Adam Eda on the sidelines for the last what is it year year and a half and suddenly he's back in like looking at the, the two of them up close last night the sheer mm-hmm. size of them very different options ability to win the ball a good high ball in like it's a very I wonder. I wonder if behind the scenes Stephen Kenny isn't going. I've set up my stall. Yeah. I'm going to play this way. Yes, everything I've had. It's, the front options have changed, and there might be a more obvious back to front ball. But I'm going to live. I'm going to die by the sword here. Like yeah, he, that, that he's reluctant to change his system because he set out his stall. Yeah, I, I think that could be a little bit to do with it. Um, but like, it's very, very easy. We we talk. The main thing you have to do in football is kick the ball in the net. If you do, if you don't do that, 
all the other stats mean nothing mm. they just dwindle away our best players our best player Evan Ferguson Obafemi Ogbeni all our best players are up the top of the park so don't complicate it get the ball up to them play from there and I look at it, it's not going to be pretty on the eye but we will win more games we'll be probably not as entertained but you'll be leaving Lansdowne Road and you'll be a little bit happier with things you'll be throwing punches we'd, we'd be toured in this group we'd be saying if we can beat the Netherlands get something against them my god we could finish second in this group but as it is you know we're, we're propping it up we're in fourth and we're only standing on top of Gibraltar and has anybody seen any attractive football in the last in the three games in this group because I haven't seen any of it well I watched France Greece last night the highlights of it and like France were kind of doing what we were doing just a bit better because they have better technical players and we're very fortunate to win that game by the way there was a high boot to the head and um, the Greece player got sent off and Bappa takes the penalty keeper to me looks like he's on the line he's certainly got one leg at very least on his own goal line referee you know under the hot Paris night decides that whatever it is 100,000 people in the stadium is going to have to result that the penalty gets retaken and they get over the line and it's a bit of a slice of luck um, but it was sort of the same type of system um, and I don't know in terms of the attractiveness I definitely felt in the stadium last night that people would be uh, now in a position where you're more willing to see a bit of a lump ball or like this thing isn't working oh, yeah. in fairness we did go back to front a little bit against Greece and stuff came off it so it's not like there, there's no there's no long balls at all can I ask you another question right it, would Jeff Hendrick and Robbie Brady have had any impact on the performance against Greece possibly um, I, I, I think uh, in international football experience cost for uh accounts for a lot it really does I think the more caps you can get on the pitch the better um, obviously there's, an, there's exceptions to that rule every now and then the types of an Evan Ferguson comes along and you just throw that out the window you say you're going in he's good enough but in general especially in the middle of the pitch I think you need caps you need experience you need people in there like Jeff wouldn't have been too bothered about Greece because he, he's felt all them feelings before he would have felt you know th- this is a lower team but maybe we're getting a little bit dominated in terms of possession he wouldn't have panicked I think there was a little bit of panic I think people I was listening to the Irish media before the game and for some reason they were saying we're favourites in this and I I was looking at the Greece team and thinking this this is a very very tight game I don't think there's any favourites in this and it it played out that way it was a very very tight game but yeah again and hindsight's a great thing because Smallbone didn't have a great game you can look and say maybe Hendrick in there would have done a little bit better but the one thing for me is he played Smallbone not a problem but he, Smallbone has to play in an advanced area he played in a flat tree and all he ended up doing was running from to Timicus to Baldock to Timicus to Baldock and after half an hour his legs were shot and we had to end up making a couple of changes but in hindsight yeah maybe uh, maybe Jeff or, or Robbie Brady could have made a bit of a difference in there uh, alright it's uh, 7.56 this morning OTB AM Live with Gillette Labs get the ultimate shave or your money back Neon Art Edition is available now if any part has joined this um, ter- Oh, the line just dropped to Vinny, so we'll get, get him back in uh, just a minute. Can you can you see further progress under Stephen Kenny? I'm not sure. I'm really, if he if he's going to keep playing this way, I mean, again, I, I keep putting myself into into. Uh, managers and coaches t- uh, mindset coming in here the one thing you don't want if you're a France if you're a Holland and you want to stand on the halfway line and dominate us the one thing you don't want us to do when we win the ball back is just clip it down the channel and get running after that's the one thing you don't want us to do because defenders don't want to run towards their own goal the w- what you want us to do not a great footballing team is to win off us and start tra- trying to play nice intricate passes because then they can counter press us and just go and hoard it straight away so I think you're taking a big big weapon away from the, the bigger nations when they want to the counter pressure if you just play it down the channel now it's not just getting it lumping it down there it's telling Obafemi it's telling Ogbeni as soon as we win it you need to start peeling off into that channel and be gone and we will have a head start in the race and then we can play from there win and throw in play in the right areas just don't play in the wrong areas so I'm saying lump it up there but then start to play. It's not lump it up there, win a throw in, throw the ball into the box from there. It's playing, it's getting it up there and playing in the right areas from there. All right, Vinnie Perth's line is back. Vinnie, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning. Uh, how are we doing? Apologies. Uh, I took Shane Hannon's uh, gig today and I took today off. Apologies, I couldn't get in. <laughs> Very good. No worries. Um, what, what now, we, now that we've seen the two games back to back, what's your assessment of where we are at the moment? Um, I think I think it's difficult because um, 
you know, I think middle of last week, I think there was arguments to be made that we made huge progress as a team and we haven't won enough matches and um, we have to accept that. Um, but uh, the Greece game was so bad, I think it's it has left a lasting effect on, on sort of the management setup. There's no doubt about that. And we have to call it what it is, I thought. Um, and I was with you on Friday night. Tactically, it was very, very poor. And... Um, I've been associated with, with with Stephen Kenny for close on twenty years, and I sort of I, I sat at the game last night, and I sat in sort of behind it, the dugout, and looked at the starting team, and I felt what what are we doing here again? It was almost like we're back in the same position in terms of playing against a lesser nation, playing with a back three, um, and again it's. The football is full of captain hindsights but I think I've said it enough times on your show when you play teams that we play against with the style of player we have you've got to change and for the first 15 minutes and I know some people will throw back it, it, who the opposition was and that but this is part of the problem the first 15 minutes of the second half I sat there I looked at Stephen and I said to myself Gaffer that's the first time I've probably seen you, your team play your way Okay, um, and what I mean by that is that 15 minutes when we went and won the game, and that's what happens in football matches. It's not all pretty for 90 minutes. James McLean on overlaps. Jason, I there was one stage I think it was on the 60th minute where James McLean crosses the ball as the left back and a flat back four, and Jason Knight as the right back almost gets in at the back post. That is, and I'm sorry for boring people, but that's Dane Massey's Deshaun Gannon. That's Stephen Kenny's way of playing that's how you beat the lesser nations you go and beat them with wing backs and, or with wingers and full backs and you overload them in wide areas and the problem we're going back to you've asked me about the bigger of the week is we don't eat we don't have enough credit in the bank as a management setup or they don't because they didn't beat the lesser nations and I was just in many ways disgusted last night coming away from the game going why have we not done that more against the lesser nations it was really really difficult and good at the same time if, if, if that sort of rant makes sense why isn't he doing that Vinny if that's you're looking at that saying that 15 minutes is your team playing your way why didn't he do that from the start I don't know I, I honestly don't know I can't I can't what's your I can't suspicion um, he, he got away from uh what makes his, himself brilliant for whatever reason. I don't know the ins and outs of the squad. He went to a back three. There was a call for a back three. You remember at the very start of his campaign, we were a little bit too open in midfield with one number six and two number eights. But um, we, we, tactically, if you look at last night in isolation, you look at the first 45 minutes, back threes don't open up. Um, they don't open up defences very well unless they're counter-attack and that's why that back three system does really well against your France um, Portugal away it's a brilliant system for that but when you have to break down a team and Gibraltar basically played 4-5-1 and had different variants of that at different stages back threes don't do that because James McLean is one-on-one -on -one with their fullback. he's got to show a little bit of magic get do something whereas in the second half he had uh, James McLean and Mikey Johnson so that drags two Gibraltar players out and maybe one on the cover and it created a little bit of space in different areas so why he went away from that I don't know I don't know um, if if the the Kenny project is over and I know I think he's he's got Everest to climb to be still in charge in two years time and I hope he does it for his him sake personally I'm not sure he's failed his way I think people could get an insight into Stephen Kenny in that first 15 minutes of the second half last night. That was his style. And that, that for me, is um, difficult. That, that's a difficult thing to take, that he hasn't done that more. So is there something in that for the games that are upcoming? Let's assume that the, the board don't panic. And I, I don't think at this point it, it looks likely that they will. It, they'd be mad to, um, to replace him at this point. It doesn't make any sense. If you take the next two games obviously it's France in Paris and the Dutch here in Dublin is there anything from that first 15 minutes for those two games or do we just go back to the the back five the back three well well, 
the, the thing is, yeah, you, you summed it up in many ways, Jerry, your question. It's the back five, the back three. So if you're not, Man City play with a back three because they're brilliant players and they dominate and they don't have to have their full, and they're allowed to put inverted wingers and that, okay? But when you're not that good, it ends up a back five. Our back five system has, will suit away in France. No issue with that. Um, we've seen that in the last game against France. And maybe that we need a huge win and Steven needs a huge win and maybe that the Dutch game he has to look at that 4-3-3 and go for broke uh, but the back five there's no doubt suits the better nations it's it's you know it's the Finland it's it's those games we've dropped points in that has meant as a management set up they don't have enough credit in the bank for the bad performance last Friday and the the tactical errors of of not going and beating teams at home, and and not doing it in style has meant that there's there's probably very little credit left in the bank. So to answer your question, I think you have to play a five against France away, but you may have to throw caution to the wind and go and beat the Dutch with that sort of four three three system. Um, listen, it's easy from the cheap seats, but tactically. Uh, they may have to do that Keith you've been in squads right so whatever about the um, whatever about the credit in the bank with it seems like the, he still has credit in the bank with the fans enough to for them to show up and there'll, there'll be a raucous atmosphere hopefully um, depending on what happens in Paris uh, against the Dutch from the player's perspective uh, if, if he was to say look we're going to go for it against the Dutch what would that do to the squad? Oh they'd love it absolutely love it um, um, I, I would imagine the player's on for example one example Friday night imagine the players found that difficult they found that they would have a lot of times when things don't go well tactically in the middle of a football match players will look to the bench for some guidance so um, not to go over Greece again and and keep hammering on about it but when when they kept switching it to the full backs and again captain hindsight but most people seen that coming before the game because they were set up players are looking for a response from the bench I think the players would would have enjoyed that second half performance oh I know it's only against Gibraltar but they would have enjoyed that like um, Mikey Johnson um, Evan Ferguson would enjoy what he has around him and Mikey Johnson on one wing um, whether it's Obafemi or Parrot on the other wing with Knight getting to the end line with, with Seamus Coleman doubling or um, uh, sorry uh James McLean doubling up on the other side whipping in crosses that's what they want Get people getting to the end line so I think the players would love it it'd be like shackles off go back to Ireland against France under trap you remember we took the shackles off over there players will love that if we go and do that against the Dutch can't do that against the French or we get turned over but at home against the Dutch I'd say the squad would really welcome if the manager threw that at them yeah, I, I think <clears throat> I think Vinny Spahn, I think the lads would absolutely love it. But just to pick up on, on something Vinny said there about lads looking at the bench, you know, these are professional players. You know, they, they play football every single day. We A problem solver is what you need on the pitch. You need somebody who can see something, can feel something and think, this isn't right. Whatever the manager has said a ha- a, a before the game, a half time, it's not working now. So we need to do it this way. And when I played for Ireland, you know, I very rarely played for Ireland, but when I did play for Ireland, the likes of John O'Shea, Richard Dunn, they didn't look to trap a Tony for advice. Robbie Keane, they, they solved problems on the pitch. We'd done it all ourselves. And, you know, you need problem solvers. And that's probably another thing. And I referenced that without shame as common this week that we don't have a leader. We don't have somebody who can solve problems. Somebody will say, I need you here, lads. Just need, need ticky tacky stuff. It's not working. Let's play in around the back. So the only talking I could see on Friday night was lads screaming at each other and giving out to each other. It's never, never. Yeah, and I, I could see Cullen doing that. You know, lads come up with me, do this. And like little things within the game, how to press. But in terms of the overall bigger picture of the game, it was all like like Vinny says looking at the bench what do we do now where do you want me now gaffer we need problem solvers because you can't have Stephen Kenny trying to scream to the far side of the pitch when there's 55,000 people in the Aviva you need you need problem solvers but then it goes back to trust then it goes back to experience how many caps have they have do they know have they been in deep water before so it's all swings and roundabouts but that, I think that's very telling when you see players looking at the bench for guidance rather than knowing what's wrong themselves there was a lot of yeah and just to balance out sorry just to balance out Keith's point is that in fairness though Keith in both games the tactical switches at half time made us better so um, 
the sense is could we have done them earlier or could we have started the game with those tactical switches so the Mikey Johnson or the two number 10s not to lose people we started in the second half of Greece we were a better team for that we should have started that way and we should have started the other night with a, with a flat back four we shouldn't have played with three centre halves so there, therefore you've got to give players a little bit of leeway as well to say set them up correctly forced and I, and I know some games go against you and I've been a manager who's, who struggled in that as I said I sit in the seat cheap seats well they're not that cheap in the Aviva anymore but I was sitting in the cheap seat last night but absolutely easy to throw stones but we shouldn't have started with a back three last night we just shouldn't it's no. just it's non-negotiable for me personally but I'm not the international manager none of the, none of this is lost on the players right they're all I'm sure having the same conversations that we're having there was a lot made during the week in the press conference about the belief Stephen Kenny do you still believe in the players this was the big thing you mentioned earlier on that you would know some of the players personally do you think the players still believe in Stephen Kenny? Um, and, and genuinely haven't uh, and I wouldn't discuss it w- with the ones I know or anything like that um, I think I think by and large players you get like especially in international setups or any t- any time you travel, there will be a bond with the staff there. Um, if if this project ends, absolutely certain amount of players in every squad will be disappointed to lose them. Some will be in many ways the modern player or the modern or any person won't be too bothered, and some be glad because it might mean they get a chance. That's just the nature of it. I I, I don't think I don't I think the setup and the way things have been run. It seems to be extremely professional, really modern day uh, staff in there um, in terms of like even the backroom staff, people wouldn't know. So people like Danny Miller or um, the, the Southampton physio in. I think the players get such high level treatment at the club now that it wasn't always the case they got that at all. And I think that's one thing that Stephen has changed and the players like the environment of it. It's high level professionalism and um, so I think they'll want this my sense is they want this project to work out but players are players and ultimately they want to win matches as well yeah I, I think there'll, it, there'll be a bit of both there'll be some players that'll be that'll want Stephen Kenny in I, I spoke to well, I didn't speak to uh, Doherty I listened to his interview after the game when he got sent off against Greece and he said definitely Stephen Kenny is the man to bring us forward so is Keith Andrews so is John O'Shea and I know Keith Andrews I know John O'Shea personally and they're infectious the love for football is very very infectious I'm sure the lads are very very close to them but there'll be lads on the periphery who'll be thinking maybe if Stephen Kenny goes I could be in here and there'll be people that fancy it there'll be people that don't fancy it so look it's it's one of those things you just need to be professional and get on with it but we, the big thing is we need problem solvers you can't have people looking at the bench when there's problems on the pitch you need to go and solve it yourself and like you said we need a tactical changes but I'd still love a Cullen I'd still love you know somebody of a, an older head there to be able to say lads this isn't working just get together for five minutes let's just do this now do it that way and managers and coaches largely will accept that if you go in and you say what are you doing <laughs> I, said, oh, I was oh, doing it because on. I thought X, Y or Z was happening Gaffer. they will largely accept that that's, that's why we need James Coleman Adrian well, no, that's no, why we need James no, no. Coleman you I, wrote I, him off I, three years I, ago not at all I did one analysis yeah, of one I did analysis of one game that yeah, was yeah, it. yeah 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 yeah. and analysis I'm sure Vinny is, uh, is laughing at that uh, no the point I was going to make was just on your point about the players discussing it I was down on the touchline uh, a little bit cheaper than Vinny I'd say uh, by all accounts from listening to his description there further down the touchline but just a couple of rows back from the front watching the players warm up in the first half particularly and Callum O'Dowd was in a full on tactical conversation with I think it might have, might have been Mikey Johnson there was a lot of gesticulating about you know uh, two or one or there was a lot of that tactical conversation going on where it was very clearly him saying what we did at half time he was preempting that going why aren't we doing like they were clearly knee deep in a conversation like in full view of everybody about how this is going on and I suppose he's probably one of those players that you talk about there in terms of being on the periphery and yeah. feeling as if he should be in the in the first 11 it's clear that we have you been in dressing rooms uh, Keith like that before where players are saying listen how are we not doing this thing I mean I guess at some point you need Callum O'Dowda to go up to the manager I mean not in the middle of the game but at some point afterwards and say you know uh you know, to have that conversation with him as opposed to just um, having it amongst themselves, I suppose. Yeah, well, I, I had it with uh, with Eddie Howe at Burnley. When Eddie Howe first came to Burnley, he fairly similar to what Stephen uh, Stephen Kenny is trying to do now. He was trying to get us playing football. The crowd at, at Burnley at Turf Mall weren't on board. They didn't want us to play football. Every time we played a backward pass, you could hear them screaming, "Get the ball forward!" It was 
they, they just weren't on board with the mm. football type of thing so we had the as players Eddie Howe is still telling us I want you to pass it out from the back and this is before you were allowed to stand inside your 18 yard box so people were coming and pressing the life out of us some of us weren't comfortable with it some of us were comfortable with it half the team was having a meeting saying lads don't listen to the manager we're going to start playing our own way the other lads were saying no we will listen to the manager and all of a sudden it became totally totally disjointed and it was all over the place we'd half the lads running towards the ball half the lads running away from the ball and it became very very disjointed but yes yeah, sometimes tactically you, don't, you might might not you might not want to do what the manager's telling you to do you might think it's naive you might want to go down a different way but at the end of the day the manager calls the shots and if he tells you to do something you have to do it but as a player I've been in a situation where I feel these things aren't working and you have to go and try and problem solve it yourself and like I said managers if you can go to a manager and say Gaffer I did this because of that I wasn't trying to undermine your tactics I just thought X, Y or Z was happening so I played this way managers will largely accept that because you're trying to solve a problem and just you know stop things from happening uh, Vinny the one thing that really needs to happen over the summer for who for whatever is happening in the future is that uh, the players who aren't playing at their clubs need to get moves and there's so many of, of our group that are in that situation at the moment and we're really hopeful that they're going to develop and that their careers will progress but we know that like the, the level of competition that they face from uh, all of the best young players in the world is incredibly intense in the top two divisions in England so it's kind of a it's a shaky enough period when, when Liam Brady was on the TV the other night saying that uh, this is the worst squad of players that he's seen in his lifetime nobody's really disagreeing with that no we're, we're not disagreeing with it because I can I can understand the point he's making to a point it's just that I, I met I, I, again I, I, I like I'm, I'm great I repeat myself but looking through Irish football through the prism of English football is what's it's what's holding us back as a nation because the amount of players playing in the premiership it's it's almost fair to you you've got to be world class um, world class maybe a, a, a bit use, I've heard you debate world class before what's the word I'm looking for you've got to be exceptional now to be a premiership footballer but but the problem with, with Liam's comments and I agree with like, Liam is a legend I agree with vast majority of that point the problem is 10-15 years ago you didn't need to be exceptional to be part of a premiership squad so world football has changed England is where it happens the premiership the the challenge the bigger challenge for me is you go back to the, some of the players that play for Greece I made this point on Friday night you've got players playing with Pauk you've got players playing with Tra the ones that have left Greece are playing with Trasborg they're playing with um, a AZ Alkmaar they're playing regular European football and group stage football okay and Keith will know this better than me championship football doesn't really equate to international football they're, they're not chalk and cheese but playing a game every three days real high intensity is completely different than international football and the advantage players like playing for AZ Alkmaar is as I said getting to a quarter finals I think it was of a, a Europa League is is experience at international type football and air players and us as a nation have to get away from that fixation and it's starting to happen slowly um, but we're starting to see players turn up in different countries and the more players that we can get exposure to the likes of Europa League football even if it's Conference League football and we're talking about not in, I'm not talking about a, from a League of Ireland hat here forget League of Ireland for a moment but the more players we can get travelling away from England and off that gravy train and into top European leagues as in when I say below the highest level Holland Eredivisie um Turkish leagues whatever it is and experience football at different levels we will improve as a nation and we've so Liam is right I think he's right it's hard to debate eras but we ain't gonna have 10-12 players playing regular premiership football anytime soon in my view yeah I, I do think we, we'll struggle some of the like the, uh, the championship and, and the, the international scene it is very very different I played the the vast majority of my me, me career in the championship and the, the championship is blood, sweat, thunder, tears it's everything but in terms of a tactical battle you probably get that when you come up against you know the top three or four in the league you might get a decent tactical battle the vast majority of it like I said there's no respect it's 100% milling into each other 
it's just relentless that championship so in terms of going to a championship team and then coming into our international setup and then being told to play 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 and uh, you know being overloaded with tactic stuff it can be quite difficult but like uh, like Vinny's saying if we can spread our wings a bit get lads all over the continent then I do think it, it will help us especially how we want to play but at the minute I think uh, I think that that's that's somewhere down the road. I think we need to fill holes for for the, for the minute and just try and win games. And the way for this Irish team to win games is get the ball out wide and put it in the box. And like I say, it might not be pretty. You might people might say Mick McCarthy all this sort of stuff, but I'd rather walk home from the Aviva having beat Greece or away from uh, Athens last week having beat Greece rather than being uh, being beaten one 0 Yeah, I think I mean it's uh, uh, the that's a binary um, comparison. But like in your imaginary world, we win those games, but it's in, in the our experience under Trap and Martin O'Neill was that there was occasional bits where we would flare up and we'd have some wins, but there was uh, a lot. I, of, I take that point, but there's it's a lot not, of dross. It's not just the anybody. We can lose to Greece, right? We can we can lose to Greece. That's not a problem. Greece are a decent team, but you can't go and lose to Greece with that performance. That's you, the thing. you can't have a ten day training camp in Turkey and in fifteen minutes concede ten corners and a penalty. And and look, I I I mean, we were me and Vinny did the game in studio here, and we were making the same point. Like I, I don't think anybody has been as vociferous in their support of Stephen Kenny and what he's trying to do as as uh, we've been on this show but it's very difficult to come out after that game and go no it's okay we're going the right direction well it, only, it feels like the only route back from here and uh, I appreciate the ludicrousness of it but the only route back from here is four points in the next window Finish shaking your head yeah. there no, I, I, I thought Adrian was going to mention something like Sam Allardyce. <laughs> throw myself I'm off. Not Vinny, uh, we're not there yet. I shouldn't make that. Jo- I shouldn't make a joke about throwing myself off anything. Sorry. Um, yeah, just listen. It, there's a hybrid. There's a hybrid of what we're looking for. Um, you know, it, it, it's it. You can't be. You you can't be Xavi and Iniesta unless you're Xavi and in, Iniesta. Okay, but you you. We probably can't continue to be that team. Remember playing, watching Ireland, and people were half volleying the ball over the shoulder, like, and you're like, you're better than that guy. So the, there is a hybrid of that, and I think I think if we're set up tactically correct, and we haven't been properly in the last two games, the evidence is there. Like, it's not as I said, it's not Captain Hindsight. It's the evidence is there. I think if we're set up correctly, we can have a good combination of. Balls down the side, as Keith said, but also there's a time now. European football, uh, international football, you've got to keep it as well. You've got to keep it as well, so you can have that hybrid. And remember, there's a seismic shift going on in Irish football, and maybe get into this another day, Jer. But there's a seismic shift going on underage in Irish football. We're teaching people to pass the ball, and you can't just then throw that out and go back to a Sam or a what, whatever and we have to have that hybrid and get results at the same time which I know is going to be difficult and we've got to come up with two uh, some balance between that where we're teaching kids to pass the ball pass the ball play a beautiful way you go to underage football in this country watch our, our international 15, 16, 17, 18 they're all playing out from the back but they're getting results as well we need this international team to get results and be a bit more pragmatic and and get things right on the way of doing it and I think what's going on honestly it's a huge shift in Irish football underneath a lot of big good things happening that's why I really need this inter- we need this international team to work out for us yeah Finny good stuff thanks so much for joining us that's uh, Vinnie Perth on the line and Keith thanks so much for joining us in the studio as well this morning don't miss all the action Rugby Daily today in your OTV podcast network bringing you everything that you need to know about rugby get your favourite local restaurants delivered to your door with Deliveroo just open the app browse some great offers take your pick and they'll take care of the rest Deliveroo food we get it up next Andy Dunn's depth chart first Don DC with Ashing O'Reilly do you think Stephen Kenny should stay on? Five hundred percent. A great manager and a great man. He hasn't got the players, but he's a brilliant, brilliant manager. What do you like about him? Everything, everything. There's nothing bad about him. He's a very honest and good man. There's a friend of mine there, Jonathan oh, Corbett, chairman of Galway United, and he thinks he's useless. He's not useless. He hasn't got the players. He's brilliant. So he needs more time, you think? Definitely, without a doubt. And he deserves it. He's an Irishman and he's looking after an Irish team. And we don't need foreigners to look after an Irish team. Do you, have you seen improvements under Stephen Kenny? I definitely. At least they're playing football. You've seen them under Martin O'Neill and Roy Keane. We're just kicking it up the air. They're worse than Jack Charlton. Will you stop? 
Jesus, he's brilliant. <laughs> they're passing the ball. Yeah, but they're but they're not getting the win. I know they're not. He's very unlucky. No, he's very unlucky. Yeah, he is really. Ah, he deserves another chance. Why wouldn't he? Yeah. He's a decent, honest man yeah. and a good manager. And he talks. He, the, the way he sees it, he talks. And he, 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 do you know, mm. there, he's not hiding behind anybody. He's not making excuses like some of the bollocks. You know. So when you heard some people this week, maybe the Irish public saying that he needs to go, how did you feel about that? I felt terrible, hurt, really hurt, and broken hearted. I'd rather have left my wife than see him go. I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> You're hoping she doesn't see this. No, no, I don't mind. She might leave me then, she might be better off. But I'm telling you. Yeah, oh, hey, my friend, look, he's hiding over there. He should go. He has to. He's hoping to be beaten tonight. I don't care whether they're beaten or not. He's an Irishman. He should be kept on. Yeah. And don't let him go. Will they win tonight? Definitely, without a doubt. And whether they do or not, he's still a good manager. Have you been always following Ireland? All, all my life. Yeah, my brother played for them. Oh, right. Who's he your did? brother? Eamon DC. He's a right. fellow player with Aston Villa, yeah. Very good. Yeah, I could have played with them too, but I drank for Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> that was a problem then. No, no, it got no, in the no. way. I got on the better side. <laughs> <laughs> That's tough, right? Thanks a million. He died and I'm still alive. Oh, God. <laughs> OTB AM. The Sports Breakfast Show from Off the Ball. Have you subscribed to the OTB Football Podcast? He is desperate to beat Shearer's record. There's no doubt about that. And I do think, given the reality that players tend to move around more now than they did then, if he does beat Shearer's record, that record may last forever. Subscribe now to the OTB Football Podcast stream wherever you get your podcasts and download the OTB Sports app. OTB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition, available now. Uh, that was uh, Don DC with uh, Ashling O'Reilly. His brother is Eamon uh, Chick DC, who won a league title with Aston Villa and was part of the European Cup winning squad. Came on against Juventus uh, when Villa won the European Cup. Uh, died of heart attack in, in 2012. So, um, yeah, that, that uh, did pretty well. Uh, I think everybody was talking about it in the aftermath. Anyway, time for us to turn our attention to the depth charts. It's World Cup. It's World Cup season. Andy Dunn. Are we ready for the World Cup, do you think? Have we, have we, have we tuned in just to, like, the... The consciousness, do you yeah, mean? The public consciousness? Like, every four years we go through this awful experience. Are we ready for it again? <laughs> um... Yeah, I think just about the, the it brings us the, no joy. It's the opposite of joy. It doesn't, and the draw this year obviously doesn't bring us any joy either. So, at least we we know in advance that this is not going to end well. You know, we 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 can resign ourselves to it, plan for the worst, the absolute worst, and then if if it doesn't happen, we won't know what to do with ourselves. We're going to get stupid excited at some point in the next one. I'm trying very stupid hard not excited. to, like set us. You know, we, the, the the pragmatism is going to exit stage left. We're going to convince ourselves to close to the tournament gets that we're definitely going to win it. <laughs> Is there not something uh, deep in the human condition that we love a bit of suffering, you know? We love it. I'm a Kildare football fan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the sports, the sp- a true sports fan loves a bit of suffering. So we have to keep building ourselves up, getting excited again. Why just, not? Just at the weekend, I was sure that Roscommon were going to beat Kildare. I was sure I was full sure and I was like I can't get excited about this can't get excited about it mm-hmm. and then there's like this miracle at the end of it and now I'm back in and it's the same with the rugby team yeah. right it's yeah. like the draw gets made and I found it hard to enjoy anything since the draw was made like Grand Slam oh that's great it's great that we won this Grand Slam wasn't it? I think the, Dan- draw, the draw though um, his friend of mine Paul Holland had mentioned to me and Paul played uh, competitive rugby up in the in the late 80s and early 90s then in, in UCC in the All-Ireland League he's the first person who said to me the draw for the World Cup is made uh, is it two and a half years before the, the tournament the draw for the Football World Cup which is an immeasurably bigger tournament is, is made about eight months beforehand yeah. because they have to factor in seedings and form and current things like that so it's beggar's belief how they make a rugby World Cup draw for a massively smaller tournament than the football so far away uh, from the actual tournament itself and you end up with a, a 
an international tournament with really probably three teams that can win it and three of the world's top five teams are in the same group it's it makes kind of no nonsensical sense. yeah it makes absolutely no like sense is it a logistical thing I don't know but it can't it's be it's not sure it can't be it's it like they've be. booked the hotels yeah. you know you're going to this hotel now instead no, it's we have stuff. trains yeah. Like, yeah. we yeah. don't even need planes in France you can just get on a fast yeah. high speed train that gets you there quicker yeah. anyway um, so we, we're doing the out half depth chart and this is fairly obvious right it's Johnny Sexton number one mm. if he's fit is he going to be fit you're, you're a physiotherapist you know a little bit about this uh, these types of things well, yeah unfortunately as a physio you have to know what's going on as well. I have no idea what's going on with him so because um, the, the information has kind of been drip fed out and yeah surgery and rehabilitation but there's not a whole lot of detail coming with it um, the actual injury itself typically it would be a surprise if he missed it is it my understanding I don't even know situation. what the injury is though yeah I, I actually need to google that but that was yeah. having spoken to somebody in the area who uh, in the immediate aftermath was like I oh, know not, not with that injury but again it was a groin something or other was it complications I'm not sure let's have a google well uh, yeah if there's a groin injury it depends if it needed surgery you know is the hip involved there's a lot of ifs and buts okay. but um, I would say um, groin injury yeah. yeah given the nature that you know he, he played a full game he came off the field did the surgery at a later date he didn't have an acute on field injury that caused massive damage it must have been he limped off that day yeah he limped off uh, I suppose he wasn't stretchered off and, and um, I would have thought yeah I think he'll be available okay. for sure okay yeah. so with Sexton our depth chart uh, we can stick the graphic back up here so Sexton 1 Jack Carley 2 Ross Byrne 3 Frawley 4 Jack Carley 5 mm-hmm. um, Frawley is likely to be close to making matchday squads isn't he? yeah yeah I think Frawley is an outlier there he was he was involved uh, starting in this time last year down in New Zealand in those Mary games and I think the Irish management saw those Mary games as crucial to the development of the squad overall it also meant down in New Zealand that we didn't lose any part of that series we beat the All Blacks in the series and we didn't lose to the Mary and I think winning that second test against the Mary completely galvanised that group I think we we tend to focus on the New Zealand test wins but what they did was very brave send down a bigger squad and kind of previously you would have said they're throwing them into the Lions then and, and you know there wasn't much hope but that squad really grew as a result of those games and Frawley was at the heart of that and uh, while he's had a completely mixed year with injuries and lack of availability I think Farrell Cat um, in particular rate him highly and he is a very very capable 10-12 option who can place kick who's a good running threat who's a very good passer he's very calm um, so yeah I think uh, he's, he's certainly one that could push uh, on match day let me ask you about this what would have happened where would Ben Healy have been if he was still Irish qualified um, I, I don't think possibly maybe I had a, a Jack Carty there in fifth I don't think he'd have well, leapfrogged much higher Okay. Uh, I thought he'd a super end to the season um, but I don't think he had got to the point where he was so dominant in games and, and outstanding that he was going to jump ahead of who's already there yeah Okay, so Frawley's behind Ross Byrne in the depth chart with Sexton, right? And yeah. Crowley is second. Why is Crowley ahead of Ross Byrne in this depth chart? Um, well, for me, he, he offers something a little different to Sexton. I think we need um, something a little different to come off the subs bench. Um, I think he's got big match temperament, which he's shown certainly in the last two to three months um, his first touch in an Irish jersey I was commentating for for uh, off the ball live at the game it was a penalty to touch that he extracted every last inch out of which many young fellas coming onto the field would have said well I'm going to make sure I get touch yeah. and I'm going to make, make sure everything you know keeps on track and we win our line out and so on and so forth he gambled on his very first touch in international rugby and I immediately <laughs> took a step back and thought hmm that's now there's somebody who's got a fair bit of confidence and I think he's carried that through in his um, his general play I, I, I don't think he's set the world on fire I don't think but he hasn't 
done a whole lot wrong either. And if you're young coming into uh, an environment like Munster or international rugby, not doing a whole lot wrong is a pretty good start. And um, I think he's got potential to, to really grow and I think his his cycle will probably be really kicking off at the next World Cup um, for now I think the fact that he's just offering that little bit different to Ross Byrne Johnny at number one Ross coming in as his understudy is a very similar style player and a very similar approach where Jack has a little bit of difference and so if you're the head coach do you not want the same thing coming off the bench in a way it's like we've got so let's assume the game plan is working and we're a few points up with 10 minutes left to go do you not want the same thing coming on or do you want somebody to actually well I think where you've got uh, potential with with Crowley to offer something different is uh, I think he's a little possibly a better running threat than, than Byrne I think um, certainly my own experience I think having someone who has the capacity to do something different he doesn't have to do something different he can still come on and toe the line and play the 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 tactical game they want to play but if he's got the capacity to do something different in terms of being a running threat he's obviously a good um, kicking game he can use variation in his kicking game he's physically strong he can play in midfield as, uh, as in one out at 12 as well where you wouldn't probably put Ross there either yeah. but I think um, I think that's where they're looking at is his versatility probably more than Ross um, as a backup to Johnny okay and I suppose the other thing then if it is something slightly different it makes the opposition second guess themselves for those final 10 12 minutes whenever he might be yeah. coming on it's like actually you know what we need to there's a different defensive setup yeah. we might need but I also think there's the factor that Ireland and Munster haven't seen what Crowley can really do or Crowley sorry I always pronounce it wrong but Crowley um, I don't think Ireland and Munster have seen the best of him yet he's very young and he's relatively uh, underexposed to the spotlight so um, yeah I think that's an advantage too whereas we've probably seen everything we can see from Texton and, and Ross Byrne so the opposition have done loads of work in yes. a way right. yeah well they won't know if we don't know what we're going to do <laughs> they don't it's interesting how, how measured you are about him because there's a real surge behind him like you know internationally he's only got a few caps a couple yeah. of replacements Fiji Italy in the Six Nations yeah. obviously late starter in that Australia game but like the surge because we sort of decided after the Six Nations well I decided that whoever you know <laughs> at that point whoever the, the, the ranking of positions was pretty clear yeah. and then suddenly the URC unfortunately uh, yeah, like yeah. it does and he shows that he's got the cojones to step up and do it when it matters and as you say like eking watching the top 14 final on Saturday night Entomac is like overcooking a really important kick to touch towards the end so like that stuff is not uh, not a mm. given like you're talking about but there seems to be this real surge behind him now mm. that has sort of put him past Ross Byrne in a lot of people's uh, depth charts you're a little bit more measured at almost than I expected well yeah I mean we um I think we're probably going to get on to it oh, but yeah, yeah. In, in the absence of Sexton I wouldn't start Crowley I would mm. start Ross Byrne yeah I think one swallow doesn't make a summer I mean the drop goal was competent it was stylish it was it was pressurised there was a lot of great things about that drop oh. goal and I loved the little finger wag at the end jogging off because it just smacked that's of worth at least co- a few confidence. percentage points absolutely I mean what, one of the great things about stylish out halves is, is uh, the post drop goal celebration we used to have a laugh how fast can you run back after kicking it because then the camera has to track and find you you know what I mean so it's all about the uh, <laughs> the optics there in terms of classic out half poses collar yeah, yeah. up but no Crowley has a bit of that for sure um, no I think um, for me in the same sense out halves get a lot of credit um, for good team performances sometimes they get a lot of slack for poor team performances and I think the Leinster team performance the management performance in that final against La Rochelle um, there'll, there'll be huge regret over it across the group and I don't think Ross Byrne ought to take the full full barrel he's getting you know what I mean people are really coming after him saying he didn't step up to the plate I think Ross Byrne has shown huge resilience over the last two or three years to come back from a place where he was utterly written off by the Irish public and media and has shown huge strength of character and ability to come back in and show he's very capable of 
surviving and thriving at times in this arena. Well, let's stick the graphic up because yeah. we have a if if Sexton's injured or is being rested for whatever reasons, you've got Ross Byrne first, Jack Carley second, Kieran yes. Frawley third. Yes, I think um, certainly what Ross showed this season just gone is he marshaled Leinster superbly to in, in every minute of every European game he played Sexton didn't play a single second in the in the European Cup um, so he marshaled that team really well through to a European final and I suppose at 17-0 and 24-7 up there was very few people questioning his capacity um, and it went way way wrong for them unfortunately after that yeah he did a great uh, pass to set up one of the tries it was yeah. a second Sheehan try yeah and I, I, I think he's got a um, dare I say it an elder statesman type of presence now um, he will give a sense of calm to the group uh, a sense of cohesion he's probably closer to Sexton in terms of how he vocally manages the group and all, all of those things are a little intangible but when you're a senior pro in that Ireland squad maybe they're looking for direction and reassurance from someone who's been around the block and someone who's been battered thrown up and down on a heap taken off but just still has the sense of control and calm to come through all of that whereas I think Crowley has arrived we've all gotten, gotten excited I don't know has he been dragged through the mill as much as Ross yet and uh, as such I think in the absence of sex and her sex and injury I think Ross's experience for me would edge him uh, still to start with Crowley as a, as a very capable backup Mm. So Crowley's the, the designated backup no matter who's starting. Yes. But in the absence of Sexton, you're starting Ross Byrne. And I, I, I can see the, the point that you're making is that um, you're plugging like for like in there, yeah. but you're giving yourself the opportunity for a wild card if you need it. Yeah. yeah I think I'm, I'm certainly not, uh, I'm not in doubt about Crowley's talent. Well, if you're saying experience is the thing talent. going against him, then what you're saying is actually in the long term, the 10 shirt is Crowley's yeah I am I mean the next cycle I, I said it a couple of minutes back I think the ne- post World Cup I think he's a, he's a massive opportunity obviously, John, obviously Johnny's going to retire Ross is going to be probably I don't know what age Ross is now 29 is he um, I mean 27 but okay yeah. exactly but, but even still you've, you'll have a fella like Crowley who'll really push I think into that next World Cup so. 28 and he'll be yeah. 29 next April so yeah and so by 32 hopefully he's he's very low mileage in terms of injuries Ross and he plays a, a game that's quite economic so yeah. he doesn't smash himself up physically but he's certainly been battered <laughs> in terms of uh, criticism and uh, selection and loss of form over the years so I think he's come through all that and that experience serves him well but yeah I think Crowley's got great talent Uh, what are the learning opportunities for Ross Byrne from the European Cup final Um, how to operate better under intense pressure I think he'll come away massively hurt uh, like the rest of that Leinster team Um, I, I thought something I thought Ross had brought into his game really well in in the last season was his ability to attack attack the line um to to release the ball as late as possible to drag on opposition defenders to get smashed up a bit as a result and then get back up off the deck and go and do it again it's something Sexton's done brilliantly for years I actually think Ross went retreated a little bit back into the pocket that is understandable when you're under intense pressure and when you've got a big lead that's uh, like um so I think he'll probably look at that uh, I think maybe as one of the key areas he'll learn from I mean you'll learn from the utter pain and dejection of that uh, that loss they will learn from it they've no other choice a month on now I think it is from the final um, what's your assessment of the drop goal the absence of a drop goal a signal a, a joint communication a yeah. team effort because yeah. they do drift that direction at one point and yeah. then like it's all it's all a bit chaotic uh, the squid rugby analysis um, you can see that he's kind of move, motioning that direction but not dominating to the point where he's ordering yeah. the, the thing and Gibson Park is doing what they always do and so it's obviously a joint collective team decision not to do this or failure not to do this so yeah. it's not on any individual but what's now a month on what, what do you make of all that. Yeah, I thought um, 
I think Ross has to take some significant part to blame in that as a 10 that he wasn't able to get that messaging in clearly enough whether he, he was trying I don't know we can only speculate I think it's just also though there's, there's um there's been a, a departure a movement away from taking drop goals that I can't fathom in big tournament games that's gone on for about 5-6 years I mean 10-15 years ago that's all that's everybody was thinking uh, yeah. only, we're only thinking yeah. get in the pocket and knock over drop goal because it makes perfect sense if you're losing in a cup final and you have a drop goal opportunity you should probably go for it yeah. it's really an, a real energiser as well like yeah, more yeah. so than a penalty that you sort of from a kickable distance it's sort of a given whereas a drop goal is sort yeah. of a halfway between there and a try in terms of the energy it gives a team oh, or a crowd well absolutely and I, I think at times there are you know there are trends and developments in the game that, that get a little become a little nonsensical you know um Overuse of the box mm. kick to exit our own territory has been going on for about three, four years, five years, maybe longer. You know, when you when you break that down, what why surrender possession work at a fifty-fifty at best, deep in your own territory, as opposed to kicking at sixty meters? Like if you win it back, you're four, you're five to six meters down the field, and if you don't win it back, the opposition have the ball five yeah. to six meters down the field. That's become to me a nonsensical trend. The next one is the abdication of responsibility to take a drop goal when we think well, we've, we've trained all week and we've played certain patterns and we're going to hold possession and we're going to score a try when a well run routine drop goal should be straightforward especially when the week before it had happened in, into the same goals yeah. to beat them Mm. It's like oh, I've just seen this thing. No, nope. yeah, not interested. Don't um, show me this. <laughs> but I Don't look at me. I certainly. I mean, to go back to your your question, I think Ross has to take some of the blame. But I think Leo and Stewart have to take plenty of the blame for that one, and so did the rest of the team. Gibson Park, the forward pack. I mean, in a cup final, you'd like to think. You know, there's at least 12, 13 people on the field who are thinking we have to take a drop goal to win this match. Therefore, X, Y, and Z needs to happen. That comes from whoever's thrown the ball into the line out to whoever's catching it, whoever's going to be the first runner off the rook or mall. I mean, are we getting closer to the post and maintaining possession in order to set our guy up? There's, there's a whole team process to a drop goal. And now, maybe Byrne didn't implement it or maybe Byrne wasn't loud enough, but it's not entirely his fault. But I think they will have sleepless nights about that. Pie chart, and he's part of it. Absolutely, well, he's a big part of it. But yeah, I, I think uh, I would certainly like to see that nonsensical trend gone by the time we get to a World Cup. Yeah, I mean, you know, if we if we if he knocks one over against uh, one of the big teams in the World Cup, we'd be like, ah, we'll, we'll happily yeah. give you that fifth star for this thing. Yeah. Uh, right. Is there any difference who plays nine for these tens to benefit? Like, is there is there an argument for starting um, Craig Casey in some games and like using our three scrum halves over the course of the tournament so that we get to the big game and make sure that Gibson Park is available to start and uh, maybe we're playing South Africa and we want Conor Murray to get in there and mm. soften them up for twenty for an hour. I think. I think the. There's certainly an argument for for um, usage of the the squad at a World Cup because it's it's so condensed. And I think, but I would come at it from the angle using the other nines is it's best done to protect Gibson Park because right. he's the clear front runner. And I think the team are a much better side when he's at nine in terms of how the whole attack flows. Um, he's he's. His decision making, his top drawer um, execution, just and he's he's done it consistently for a long period now. Um, so I, I think the argument is not so much that um, horses for courses we're picking a person who'll play better against South Africa or against Scotland. I think it's more we're not exposing Gibson Park to five, six, 80 minute periods in a row. And I think Murray's had a super end to the year. I think Casey, um, Casey, I still have, I've had, I had some question marks, but then in the six nations, when he came on and managed the end of the French game so well with Byrne, he, he, um, he went up a few notches in terms of, I, I questioned whether he had that calm, 
game management yeah. um, in his in his toolbox and he showed he did whereas I thought he was a high tempo player and and well, that's excellent and, and it's, it was at, the, at times it was kind of opposite to Murray in the Munster mm-hmm. jersey you can't have you can't be one paced fast you can't be one paced slow I was yeah. querying was he a one paced and that one pace being very fast high tempo and I think can he slow a game down and manage it and he showed that too so yeah there's, there's for sure in a World Cup you, there's a there's a fair argument to say they move it around a bit in terms of who starts what games but I think ultimately that's with a, with a view to protecting excess game time for Gibson Park and risk of injury I had one last question about Sexton um, at some point he won't be as good a player as he used to be mm. we've been saying this now <laughs> Uh, my parents moved house recently and I found like a, a Irish Times um, oh who's going to replace Johnny Sexton it was 2011 I'm fairly sure well, it wasn't 2011 it was like it was a, a good five six years ago I was like uh, um, so we've been we've been as uh, exercised about this as we have about the World Cup quarter final berth um, how do they make sure that it doesn't happen before the World Cup like how do they know in training like is it I, I don't think they do. I think they can't know in training I think uh, I don't think it's going to happen I just he's he's mentally too strong as long as his body can hold up that he's literally gets on a flight to France and gets a bit of a Paul McGrath contract for the World Cup and maybe under trains um, hopefully he's wrapped in a bit of cotton wool and uh, I don't anticipate that lack of game time or exposure over the summer to regular rugby is going to have any impact on him he's not he's shown too many times that he can hit the ground running there are certain players who can come back in and hit the ground running at, at the right intensity and tempo and they are few and far between but he's been around the block for since 20 years yeah it's yeah. amazing that if we were to have Ruan the clock a year and to have had, re-had this conversation mm-hmm. about who would have been number two in that power ranking yeah. and his name has not come up no Joey Carberry yeah it's uh, I feel I really do feel for Joey um, but it's it's um, in the absence of any game time he he's an example of where I said look Sexton can he's earned that right over 20 years um, and he's shown Sexton's shown on many occasions undercooked he can come in and perform at a high level I think Carberry is not like that I think he's the type of player who needs five six games in a row on form playing really well to feature now he he got a, an extended run he had a few injuries but he was certainly the first choice number one for a long time there with Munster and um Ironically, I thought when he got into the Irish squad, he had better performances and he, he represented himself very well and he never let us down. But in the absence of him playing regularly for Munster at 10, he's, um, I think he's Im- impacted by that and probably sh- a little shock in terms of confidence. And um, yeah, it's it's a sad and spectacular it's, it's fall from dramatic, grace. So yeah. dramatic. Yeah, yeah. You definitely feel for the guy. I can't imagine yeah. what he's going through. I presume Ben Healy's departure opens a chink of light for him, but like he's got to try yeah. and get back in the pitch and yeah. remind yeah. everybody what he can do. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I've i often said that I, I saw him playing, I think his first start for Leinster as a 10 in the Heineken Cup. He beat 11 players in one half, um, which was an incredible start. And I was watching it in the RDS and I really thought this is the next generation. Um, but for a multitude of reasons, I suspect he has he's gone away from that type of game. Um, where he's a, a real threat as a ball carrying 10 uh, as an attacking 10 and he's he's dropped back into the pocket more often he's gone lateral when he attacks his, his kicking game has been very good um, but I think his point of difference when he first came in was that ability to be a huge threat as a first, a first receiver and I think that gets beaten out of a lot of Irish 10s uh, including myself 20 odd years ago because you're you're perceived to be n- a, a not a game manager not a good game manager if you are a good threat as a first receiver now there's a f- th- I can understand that too but it doesn't happen in Australia or New Zealand for example it gets encouraged yes yeah. so, yeah. Uh, keep, you keep doing that and we'll follow you yeah and I think um, can he recover 
I, I don't know because the Irish mentality to a 10 he's he's feel, I look at Joey and I feel like he's got a little lost and caught between two stools he's mm. subjected to countless different managers who with very very strong opinions um, over five six years whether it was with Joe Schmidt in Leinster or Ireland whether it was with Graham Rountree now uh, Mike Prendergast Stephen Larkham in the middle there's and Van Grand. there's a lot of people saying different things to him and and then there's everyone saying why can't you be more like Johnny and yeah. nobody's ever said why don't you just be yourself and we'll we'll adapt to what you do and I think as a result he's he's gotten a little lost in it all and I think it showed in his performances and eventually he started to drop out of favour so it, it is um, Would you just go to France and have the crack if you were him and be like free from the Irish selection problems and go and enjoy yourself and find a rugby culture that appreciates you? Uh, yeah I would uh, in short, I think, I think at this stage, I think if he went and joined a top side in France and with a with a coaching team and a, and a an approach that was maybe less structured, which they can be down there still, and um, just liberate liberate yourself. You never know what could happen. Yeah, yeah. All right, Andy. Good stuff. Uh, where? How far are we going in the World Cup? Nice, nice handy question to finish up on. All the way. Do you think all so? Are you feeling, you're feeling okay with this? <laughs> That's nice and vague to yeah. mean anything. <laughs> We're going all the way. <laughs> Out of the pool. <laughs> I know. Uh, uh, I, so I've never thought, I've never prior to a World Cup thought genuinely thought we were capable of winning it ever. I've never thought that. I, thought, I would have thought we'd have gone further in previous World Cups than we have yeah. but I've never thought we were capable of winning a World Cup I, I absolutely think this group are capable of winning a World Cup so all the way baby all the way baby you heard it here first Andy good stuff thanks a million for joining us this morning OTBAM with Gillette Labs get the ultimate shave or your money back Neon Art Edition is available now up next we're going to Berlin to join Henry McKean live from the Special Olympics in the meantime here's Nathan speaking with Evan Ferguson last night well, Evan, it's been uh, six months of firsts for you, and to finish it with a first competitive goal for your country, how does that feel? Yeah, it's been it's been a good six months. It's gone very quick, but it's nice. It's a nice way to finish it. Yeah. Can you get your head around just how well the six months have gone for you? I, I don't think so. I think it's all just gone very quick, and I think you know, I'll have a bit of time now to relax and take it all in. Uh, tonight was was tough going for forty five minutes. What was your experience of that first half and what was the conversation like in the dressing room at halftime? I think it was a tough 90 minutes. I think they done well. They knew what they were going to do and it was frustrating, but I think we needed to just keep doing what we were doing, try to move them side to side and tore them out and they leave a gap, which they did. It's probably your first time playing in a game like that at senior level where there's such expectation, not just to win, but to win well. Did you have to change your own mindset to prepare mentally for the fact that it probably wasn't going to be as easy as everybody said it would? I don't think so. I, don't, I wouldn't change it going into a game. I think we knew what we had to do going into the game and obviously we know what the fans are saying and you do hear it, Like, but we went back and we got the three points. That's uh, Evan Ferguson in conversation with Nathan. The rest of the conversation was about uh, going on holidays and uh, having the crack with his mates who are doing the leaving cert. So you can get that on our social channel. Subscribe on Twitter, at Off The Ball, or on Instagram, also at Off The Ball. Now, it is day three of the Special Olympics World Games in Berlin. Team Ireland has 73 athletes competing in 12 sports out of 7,000 athletes from 190 countries. The opening ceremony took place in the 1936 Berlin Olympic Stadium with a dark history, which has now turned to light. Henry McKean is in Berlin for us now. Henry, good morning. A good morning and hello. This is Berlin calling and we're here at the Brandenburg Gate. It's actually started to rain. It's about 28 degrees and the athletes, they're already out there competing. And as you mentioned, we've won some medals already uh, with uh, Timothy uh, Horhan winning um, gold. So just some brilliant, brilliant results as well from uh, Owen O'Neill uh, winning uh, in the open water uh, and uh, Timothy winning um, the uh, uh, 5,000 metres. Um, um, uh, on the track uh, and such an amazing atmosphere and I'm glad there you mentioned Jay you mentioned the, the Second World War because we're steeped in history where I'm standing right now for example just 78 years ago uh, it was the end of the war and you mentioned the 1936 Olympics which obviously was uh, it was a Nazi Games and for the uh, Special Olympics to come here it's breaking down barriers it's admitting it's saying sorry it's actually saying look we made mistakes and now we're going to embrace people with learning difficulties we are going to 
hug them. And there's been so many Special Olympics special moments. Uh, I had a chat with Maria Shriver, who is uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's um, ex-wife, but also uh, Timothy Shriver's uh, brother, and her uncle was JFK. And just behind, us, as we mentioned, uh, the Brandenburg Gates. Uh, and she talks about that, about breaking down barriers. So it's just been absolutely wonderful. Uh, and the fact that they've got through the pandemic, here we are, the athletes are competing again. And tomorrow, believe it or not, Jer, is the 20th anniversary of the Dublin Special Olympics, the first time that it left the United States. And you remember that. You had Muhammad Ali, John Bon Jovi uh, in the same room together with um, uh, uh, other huge, huge names. Uh, we mentioned Arnie there uh, uh, and Nelson Mandela was there too. Uh, and great memories. And here we are making more great memories. Uh, and we've got bocce this morning, which is a bit like bowling. We've got basketball. Uh, we've got gymnastics. There might be some medals and gymnastics. And 73 um, athletes from four corners of Ireland. Uh, another sport that's, you know, both sides of the border. So just wonderful, wonderful to be here. And believe it or not, Jer, this is my sixth Games, if you include uh, Dublin and then the uh, Athens uh, and then LA, Abu Dhabi, and also the Winter Games, where I didn't get to meet Arnold Schwarzenegger in Austria. But no, I just have to stop going on about Arnie. But yeah, just, just absolutely um, fantastic here in Berlin. Uh, I was going to say you're a veteran of this now, Henry. How do they all compare? Has it continued to grow and get bigger or has it always just been an absolutely massive extravaganza? Well, yeah, I mean, this is the largest inclusive games of the year. I mean, the, you know, there's 7,000 athletes competing. That's 7,000. Uh, and there's 22,000 volunteers. Ireland, you could say, what are we good at? We're good at volunteering. And there's loads of Irish volunteers everywhere you go helping out. Um, so it's growing. It's getting bigger. Uh, and also, uh, let's say, for example, you're from a, a, a country that's developing or a very, very poor country. Uh, there, there's a healthy athlete. So if you're having trouble seeing or trouble hearing, there's doctors on hand. So there's loads of goodness that comes out of this. And, Jer, I know you've been involved in the Special Olympics also. You get this kind of tingly feeling uh, when something great happens. There's this joy. You could say that about any sport. I mean, you can feel this amazing joy. This is why we have so many sports fans out there, but even more so in the Special Olympics, because a lot of these people with learning difficulties, they were shunted. Uh, like the Germans 78 years ago, they were pushed to the side and now they are celebrated. They've got something to live for. Uh, they've got joy, they've got smiles and they feel confident. Sport gives confidence and that's the most important thing. And it's just, it truly is, as uh, Ray uh, McManus said uh, from Sports File, it's like a good bag of chips. You just can't put it down. You can't stop. Uh, you know, lovely. Uh, it's, it's, it's pure, pure sport at its purest. All right, Henry, enjoy the rest of it. Uh, what else has to come today? Uh, we've got lots on. I'm actually going to head over to this huge centre uh, called the Messe, which goes on for about two kilometres. So there we've got everything from basketball to bocce to gymnastics. I'm going to spend a number of hours there. And I'm also going to be meeting uh, Mary Davis, who's head of uh, Euro Asia uh, Olympics, Special Olympics. She's still involved. And obviously she was very involved uh, 20 years ago. So lots of uh, medal potential and just lots and lots of games, lots of sport and some serious crack, maybe some bratwurst as well. Perhaps a cold beer as well can't beat a German lager at 28 degrees you probably deserve it Henry good stuff <laughs> thanks a million for joining us cheers more from Henry McKean on his own social channels we've there's uh, videos from yesterday as well we're just having some difficulty playing them at the moment so apologies about that but um, I know he had got a couple of videos in particular from the winners yesterday so Timothy Marhan picked up gold in the 5000 metres Owen O'Donnell picked up a bronze in the open water swimming and Jenny O'Halloran won in rhythmic gymnastics and so there are videos of medal ceremonies and uh, parents and athletes all on Henry's socials and you'll get them on the New Talk social as well Berlin is some city it is one of the best cities in the in on the planet. Uh, I went there for my stag do, and I uh, went to see Bayern Munich against Hertha Berlin. All right, the Olympic Stadion. Um, really good. It was November. It was freezing cold. We hadn't really uh, banked on that. There was like fifteen Irish lads all in their uh, t-shirts or, if best case, jumpers. The Germans with their blankets out and all the little warmers that you know those little packs that you bring with you. They had the whole and they were looking at us going, "Are you like some sort of a?" Um, Jeremy Beadle's about or what's going on here like and then there was like some sort of a hot air vent just outside, at the back of the stadium so at half time there was a lot of lemmings stood on it sort of side by side um, but I always say my uh, so my brother spent a bit of time in Germany and he was leading the uh, 
the charge out there for the couple of days as to, you know, because he'd been in Berlin, spent a bit of time, speaks German, was able to sort of corral us around. First stag do ever to go away for a, a stag do and come back fitter than when we left. <laughs> Basically, had a walking tour of Berlin trying to find pubs unsuccessfully. But um, very good spot. Shots fired at the brother. Ah, they've been, sh- they've been, they've been shot in his, his He's just watching before. this morning going, oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Drumming into the bus there. But a uh, great city. Amazing, amazing spot. Highly recommend it. Uh, I hope that Joey Carberry clears his head says Adrian Long and his coaches encourage him to go back to his natural game having him and Jack Crowley push each other can only be good for Munster and Ireland Um, yeah at the same time maybe the right thing for him to do is to get out of the system here which is not working for him at the moment and to just go and find a head coach who says you're the number one guy here and you, you follow and we'll lead. I think if he was to get a number one opportunity he'd be mad not to take it but um, there must be a big part of Joey Carberry given everything that he's achieved given the drives that he's had given the decisions that he's made in his career which have been tough decisions clearly at times there must be a part of him going no I'm staying here and I'm digging in and I'm getting that shirt back and I'm going to fight for everything I'm worth like uh, you know I do think if there's a French club coming from, there's a lot of money on the table. Um, it's if if somebody is promising him the ten shirt, that's probably still not something that he'd be able to turn down. But um, well, because there are other options. Obviously, you could the IRFU could decide that the experiment with Billy Burns in Ulster is over and mm-hmm. say, look, this is an opportunity for you. I know before we were like, you have to go here and it's the right thing for you. Now we're like, would you be interested in this as opposed to... Um, Has any player ever played for all four provinces? Because at that point, he'd be, he'd be one retired move away from the from bingo. Um, but from a career perspective, it would make some sense. It could make some sense at this stage. Yeah. you do. I do definitely feel from... I've been thinking about it sort of like that... He's been water boy at some of those URC games, and I'm sure behind the scenes his attitude is absolutely spot on. But like, there's a big difference between that and getting a shirt in your back, getting back in the 23, uh, getting back in the 15. Uh, I mean, he's so far away from the Ireland setup at the minute. It's because it was a surprise when it happened when they, we was left out of the Six Nations squad. It was like, oh my god, I can't believe he's not doesn't feature. And in such a short period of time, he's just his prospects have fallen like stone. Uh, yeah. So, uh, right. Somebody Lots. there. Somebody. Adrian Long's been back in the comments to suggest about our our shout about maybe going to France. He uh, Raj question mark. He asks. He obviously has been in the market for Munster out has before. Um, I think he's happy with what he has attended. Crowley or Healy was after Crowley. It. Crowley. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm glad that didn't happen. Ultimately, wouldn't be playing for us in the World Cup. Well, oh, that was his. Uh, would you make it? Would you? Would you? Would we make a, an exception for this World Cup? Like, uh, well, maybe, maybe we're, not, we're obviously not making any exceptions. Sexton, uh, Sexton's fitness, depending, but like at that time, Crowley was a relative unknown. Certainly, certainly nowhere near the Ireland scene at that stage. And his rationale was, I'm going to hang on, and I'm going to uh, try and fight for from a place with Ireland. Uh, Chris says, I'm a season ticket with Ireland the last few years. The years with Kenny have been the most enjoyable. Long may it continue. People have short memories. Like, I mean, this is this is the thing, right? So. I, I I understand that it's not binary, that it's not uh, Stephen Kenny or Big Sam, but like football is littered with people massively overreacting to um, things. All sports are are littered with massive overreactions to a, a period of what is perceived to be failure. Um, if if we don't find a team that plays football that excites the crowd, then they're not going to sell the stadium out and the team won't end up, end up being a successful winning team and we'll, we'll turn away because that's what happened well it is the people in the ground last night that will decide the fate of Stephen Kenny like ultimately that's it and there were booze at half time there's no getting away from it it's, I'm, I'm putting about a 30% figure on it it was short but it was very very um, audible at that time and like I do think there, so, the, so Vinny presents it that at half time I'm seeing 15 minutes of Stephen Kenny fo- football and I'm wondering is his team playing his way and I'm wondering Gaffer why have we not done this before and you can look at that as a positive that he's clocked that at half time and changed it or there's a slight concern that at that level that you know he hasn't gone with that to begin with and so there's that and there's marrying it with a bit more uh, I'm, I have got, certainly got to the point now where I'm open for more a more pragmatic approach, particularly given the tools we have at the other end of the pitch. And if that needs to be playing it, playing it down, 
at times and lumping it at times. Well, we we do we do we haven't so like <laughs> I think we could do a bit. I, certainly looking at it last night. There wasn't. There wasn't. But the lump, the there lump wasn't, wasn't enough gonna, lumping. But the lump wasn't going to work last night. Like against well, a team who are who have stuff wasn't ten working. defenders. But it didn't. It did at the start of the second half. Is, is Vinny's point is that once you actually uh, go to your flat back four and have a winger in the team, then all of a sudden we play well and we create the chances and we score yeah. the goals. Yeah, like, players are less isolated. Richard Dunn was talking about Virgil last night about that sort of. You have a full back and a winger suddenly, uh, suddenly in a position where there was only a winger before. Um, yeah. I don't know. Pragmatism is what I'm all about. Uh, pragmatism is very boring. Well, uh, do you know, I take, I take a bit of boring that might have got us through on Friday night. That's that is. I'm absolutely saying that. That uh, See, I I don't think that uh, it's the absence of pragmatism. I think that there's uh, the the truth of what Brady is saying and the truth I think of what Keith Tracy was saying is that there's no leaders in the team at the moment when when we had the injuries that we had. Um, without Coleman that you could expect more from John Egan and you could expect more from Josh Cullen because he's had a full season of playing football in a team that has been successful um, but we didn't have anybody who was able to interrupt the pattern and maybe that's where the experience comes in maybe that's where if we'd started with James McLean instead of Callum O'Dowda McLean I don't know you know somebody just needed to uh, get the ball and keep the ball mm. or go down injured and uh, that first 10 minutes we could not stop what Greece were doing and that's the bit where you're like okay what's happening here and who who is actually going to be able to interrupt the pattern not having the wherewithal or the, the smarts to work out that problem um, that's an indictment of the team and it is an indictment of the management team as well like they have to you know you've got to give the, the players that confidence but difficult to manufacture you know like you listen to um, the story that Stuart Lancaster would have told about the Ireland players who were at Leinster and how quiet they were and how they had to work and work and work and work and work on um, and they were all underage internationals who come through the system and they all needed leadership training and being able to speak up more and talk to each other more and at the moment of most critical needs that broke down too when nobody on the pitch could actually communicate to go okay we're going to go for drop goal here lads this, this is a fairly obvious match winning situation here time in the clock so anyway yeah um, I, I think there's a deficit of that at the minute I also think that like at the back of Friday night it's not just an isolated thing obviously in the media the manager and the players come out and they say listen we've got to move on from that but there is a reality of what's actually happening at the pitch and how uh, such a negative result like that in the manner of it does have to permeate the mindset of the players like it does have to impact on their mindset on the pitch last night the where criticism. things are going their way the criticism and also the evidence of the system not really working like we'd all hope it would yeah and the other thing is that uh, you've got to bear in mind this uh, with, I'd say with the exception of maybe Scotland and, and England at the moment and potentially maybe Spain but even Spain and maybe Croatia but everybody else in the world thinks their international manager is terrible and the players are awful because we're used to watching the best players in the world playing the yeah. Champions League week in week out and why can't we why can't we have Mbappe yeah why can't um, we have do you know that's well, the, the Ferguson conversation I certainly am sort of maybe the most guilty of it where I'm always looking at him playing for Brighton thinking is there some way we, could we just I, I mean yeah. you look at the sum of the parts and they're not the same exactly alright now we will be hosting a massive night of celebration for the Republic of Ireland women's national team in partnership with Sky it's coming your way on the 28th of June in the Mansion House in Dublin Sky proud primary partners of the Republic of Ireland women's national team here's some highlights on the OTV podcast network for you today the football pod uh, rugby daily and Ireland post match reaction including uh, Evan Ferguson Adam Ida, and a brilliant interview with James McLean on the uh, experience of his 100th cap after the break Maria Curley the Tipperary football captain and Chloe Mori Claire Camogie stalwart uh, first here's Vicky Wall speaking yesterday at the players press gathering Vicky Wall tell us a little bit about why you're here today yes yeah, well so we're here today in um, solidarity with the senior intermediate and junior um, LGFA and Camogie intercounty players I suppose just to, to make a statement that for the remainder of the 2023 season we'll be playing under protest um, we've asked and the state of play report has been released um, nine weeks ago with an ask for the NGBs to sit down together and collectively come up with a solution for a minimum standard agreement for a charter for 2024 
um, has been listened to and as players we're just not willing to, to wait any longer for, for an answer. And what does a protest look like? Um, I suppose it's something that we hopefully won't have to um, come to. That's why we're here today um, collectively uh, to, to ask the NGBs to literally sit down and talk to us about solutions. I suppose we haven't even got to the stage of looking at the solutions because we haven't been given the opportunity to. Um, but we, we want to um, we want to solve it. We don't want to have to protest. We don't want, don't want to have to be sitting here on a Monday um, before our championship games this week doing this. But I suppose it's just it's a necessity at the moment. You're listening to OTB AM. Top pocket goal! Ahead of this summer's football in Australia. We are going to Australia. It's what dreams are made of. We'll be hosting a night of celebration for the Republic of Ireland women's national team in partnership with Sky and it's coming your way on June 28th in the Mansion House in Dublin. What a moment for the Republic of Ireland. We'll be joined by the full squad. I don't know what we've just done. You know, I did believe we could do it. As well as some other great guests as we give the team a night to remember. Emma Bird is in tears. <laughs> I can't believe it. We finally done it. Tune in to all of Off The Ball's channels for a chance to win tickets to this exclusive event. Sky, proud primary partners of the Republic of Ireland women's national team. Out believe together and we can go anywhere. They are going to the World Cup Finals! OTB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition, available now. So you heard Vicky Wall speaking with Ashley there before the outbreak. I'm delighted to say we've got Maria Curley the, uh, from Tipperary Footballer and Chloe Mori, the uh, camogie player with Claire, with us this morning to talk to us more about yesterday's press conference where um, both the footballers and the camogie players have said they're going to be playing the rest of the season under protest. Uh, Maria, I might start with you. Obviously, to get to this stage of the season where you gather such a, an array of talent together in the middle of the championship season to come out and talk about something that isn't actually happening on the field of play it must have reached a boiling point of frustration to crystallise everybody to get together so what was it that was the trigger do you think that got everybody um, to the point where they were like okay enough of this we just have to actually have to make a stand Hi, yeah, good morning. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, look, I think there's been a number of things that have happened over the last couple of weeks. Um, we saw controversy with the Cavan ladies footballers and the Kildare ladies camogie players. So I suppose they were two individual counties that were fighting battles themselves. And then I guess the fact that the state of play report was released by the GPA and presented to the NGBs and the fact that nothing was really done off the back of that and, and that we didn't really get any correspondence from Ladies Gaelic probably annoyed players and, and, and captains and different different squads as well so I think it's been a combination of a couple of things over the last couple of months um, and we're at the point now where we're just sick of it and, and, and we're sick of not being heard and, and I think that's why we, we all decided we needed to come together and do something as a, as a unified group and, and not leave individual counties fight their own battles you know Yeah because obviously by uh, pooling your powers uh, it, it sharpens the mind of the governing bodies in particular Chloe will you just explain to anybody who's kind of come into this story and doesn't fully understand what the state of play report actually was it, it kind of it's, it's a real important staging post in this because it's the kind of start of the documentation of this process yeah, so basically the GPA, which is the Gaelic Players Association, essentially an organization or union um, set up by players for players. And um, let's say the men's GPA has been around longer than the women's one, the WGPA, but we actually merged recently. Um, and so they've it's been excellent, to be honest. Um, and it's probably, on a side note, it's a really good, like uh, if you were to look at an organization that can work together, both men and women, and where equality is across the board, the GPA is probably a very good uh, starting point to look at. But the State of Play report then is essentially a survey or a report given out to both uh, the men's intercounty players and women's intercounty players to see where they're at in terms of what they're getting with their teams, basically everything in their life, how their life is faring as they play intercounty, as through their intercounty career, essentially. So we're looking at med uh, like their welfare in terms of uh, medical treatment, physio needs, SNC, um, the cost of playing is a big part of the report. Um, and there's huge discrepancies between, I suppose, the male or male counterpart, counterparts, sorry, and our female counterparts. And so, um, like Maria said, there's probably been two like 
big events in terms of the Calvin ladies footballers and Kildare Camogie players. But I think these things or these have been issues for a very long time. I think the government grants which have been noted have been a help. But I'd hate to see how things would be in 2023 if we didn't have those government grants. But I suppose another way to look at it is we do have those government grants, but we're, there's still stories, um, there's still anecdotes coming out about, I suppose, the state, as you say, the state of play in um, female intercounty careers at the moment. It's basically costing you money to play. Yeah, no, essentially. I mean, it, uh, we brought up some, like, it's funny because we were all there yesterday, but girls are very, they're, they're kind of... Um, a little bit slower to kind of say stories because we're very aware that a lot of this isn't a county board issue as such. Um, I think their hands are tied. I think this is where we're going at. We're really, it's the Camogie Association and the Ladies Gaelic Football Association GA from a top level. Um, our county boards need help, they need guidance um, and they need support. But we were saying yesterday, there's girls who have to give up part-time jobs. Um, we don't get travel expenses. Um, if you need a scan or for example, I'll use myself, it's no problem. I let's say if my knee scraped, then I'm my fifteenth year playing Kamobi, so I've my two knees scraped, I had surgery and um I had to front up the cost of that myself. Um once when I was in college it was fine when I was working um I'm a teacher, but um I was out of pocket for that and I only got maybe reimbursed about half of it. Um we have girls in counties going into their elveries or lifestyle sports, having to buy their county crest gear because they're not uh, being supplied with gear. Um, those are just some stories. I'm sure if we were saying yesterday, you could get a book. Um, and if it was anonymous, you'd have some stories and you'd have some bestseller. Um, but yeah, that's that's where we're at at the moment. So listen, I think it's a thing where it's, we're used to being like, just put up and shut up. Um, but we're not really willing to do that anymore. And so that's why we're playing the rest of the championship um, in protest. The points, Chloe, about they the need guidance and they need support and obviously your later point there is that they need money and we're in the uh, process of moving towards this integration. Is part of this about a sense that there's a lot of money swilling around there and this could be solved very easily and it doesn't need to wait for that integration? Yeah, look, I'll, uh, I'd be, I, my, my, my opinion on it is essentially we've all voted for integration and I've seen a lot of things on social media over the last while as well. Like we've all voted for social media, the member, or we've, sorry, we've all voted for integration, okay? And so in principle, we should now be acting as, you know, one organisation and we understand that that process will take, the foreign process of, you know, setting up your boardroom, your committees, that'll take time, we get that. Now we've been in the listening stage of it for maybe the past 18 months or so, but we feel that this is a charter or this is a document that can be created where the three organisations come together. It's a very achievable, like we would say it's a very achievable document, a, a standard, a minimum standards charter uh, that can be agreed upon by the three. Um, like I think Tom was saying yesterday, Tom Parsons, he was saying that there's about 150 million profit in the GA and it's not us just coming in to take it. But if we've all voted for integration, we now have to see ourselves as one big organisation instead of this thing. Well, well, you're Camogie, you're Ladies Gaelic Football, sort out yourselves. We have voted, the membership has voted for integration. Yes, we have to wait for that formal process to happen. But I think this could be something potentially smaller for them, but would have a massive impact that could greatly help um, the intercounty careers of female athletes at the moment. Yeah, Maria, the, um, there's, there's a couple of different things that are happening simultaneously. So the integration is happening, but at the same time, it's official government policy about having uh, quotas uh, at board level in all of the NGBs. And there's a significant threat to the GAA's funding if they don't actually recruit and employ women on their committees in much greater numbers than they're at at the minute. And just recently, there's been some soundings drifting out through the GEA media that, oh, maybe maybe they should wait until after the integration happens to try and meet the quotas. I'm thinking, absolutely not. I'm sorry, but if you can't fulfil the quotas, you're not trying. And there's loads of opportunities. In, in every GEA club in Ireland, uh, the, the women are 
key to making those GA clubs successful and clearly there is an issue with allowing those women the opportunities to represent clubs at county board level and on committees and it's up to the GA to fix that instead of putting out the story oh maybe after integration it'll all be fine because it's almost like um, integration is some kind of silver bullet to the issues that the organisation has had when it has come to not treating the women's teams with equality not giving them pitches not making sure the showers were turned on those, those countless stories that we've just heard there from Chloe so you've got a real opportunity and a window here to make sure that something actually happens from it having met everybody yesterday in person what was your takeaway from just how resolute the group will be to make sure that something happens here yeah look I think we have a massive responsibility um, like we're not acting on ourselves we're acting on behalf of our teams but also on behalf of the girls that are coming after us you know um, I, I'd like to hope that just Tipperary ladies and every ladies football and camogie team will be successful strong competitors in the future and, and that's going to be long after Chloe and I are finished up um, and if we don't start to do something now how much longer is it going to take um, you know we've all seen the research come out about integration and we do know it's going to take time but you know we can't wait another five years before we started being treated right we're losing players you know each year based on financial costs it, it costs money to play inter-county football and camogie for, for your inter-county teams which shouldn't be the case you know we heard examples yesterday from different counties of girls having to choose between picking a third level education or playing for their county like that is not on and it's not good enough if you're good enough to play inter-county football or camogie you should be entitled to do so and you know if it's a financial thing that's stopping you for that because of these associations that bear in mind have resources to sort this out but just are choosing not to do so um, when you look at any other company or any other business you know I work for the HSE and if it was a case that they were paying their male you know workers mileage rates and they decided oh look we won't pay our, our women worker mileage rates do you know how, how good do you think we'd get on in, in this company so when you look at it like that I, I know we're all trying to come under one of the under the one body but at the same time we can't wait five years to start being treated with equality you know this thing can be sorted out by a simple document where all we're asking for is basic minimum standards to be treated the same as the men are treated and we've got on with it for years and things have improved Uh, and like Chloe mentioned the GPA worked really hard on equalising government funding for us and that has happened but at the same time that's a very small figure with regards to what it actually takes to run an inter-county setup and the amount of money that each individual girl is putting into playing themselves. So central to this call isn't just about the LGFA and the Camogie Association. It's actually also the GEA, that central body, that Croke Park themselves to get involved and to intervene. And as Adrian was saying, to put their hands in their pockets to equalise this now. Yeah, absolutely. And look, we've never said that we could do it alone. Um, In order for this to happen, we need the support of everybody. We need to pool the three sets of resources and we're completely aware of that but like you said you know in, in terms of clubs in terms of inter-county setups in terms of companies women are essential to that as well um, so I think providing support to us is, is just a basic minimum standard to be honest Chloe, uh, Tom Parsons, I know yesterday was talking about the passive strike. He was describing the the protest as it is the minute he talked about uh, players opting out of squads in ones and twos and maybe a little bit more. Um, Number one, is that your experience of it that you've seen over the years players just opt out because they can't take the financial hit? And number two, have you spoken as a group about what moves beyond the current, what's been called a protest, or as he calls it, passive strike? Um, so in regards to your first question, absolutely, like I'm in my 15th year now, Claire Camogie. Um, <laughs> it's a miracle I've survived this long on it, but uh, uh, absolutely there's girls who have unfortunately had to just move on from and go, I just can't do this anymore. I can't, like we had people's parents having to bring them to training. Um, we've had, like I said, there's been girls and this is not just like, or this is experiences we've heard over the last few days. Um, girls having to pay for their own surgeries, like girls having to choose in, will I take a part-time job or am I going to try, you know, play county? Um, you know, needing to use team doctor, uh, not able, don't having a clue about nutrition, so not having access to nutritionists. Um, even playing gear, having to go off and try buy a playing gear or ask one of the girls, can they um, 
now you'd have to be very good friends with her she, but to ask can they have money for socks and a skirt or things like that um, her these helmets borrowing begging stealing sometimes um, so there is a like and I suppose the cost of living crisis right now and stuff and I think this is kind of um, exasperating things as well but uh, there's, there's huge issues there that need to be dealt with mm-hmm. and we're all we're asking is that they come into that room and try sort a document like Maria said. We're not asking for anything massive. We understand the, the process of integration, but we just want them to listen to the issues that we've been explaining for not only weeks, but years to come into a room and see, can we all come up with a solution to this? That's all. And I suppose then with regards to the passive protest, um, there we had a, obviously before the uh, media yesterday, we had a small uh, meeting amongst ourselves. Um, Tom had mentioned that if we don't get positive movement with regards what we're asking for, um, the pro the I suppose survey the members to see what type of protest um, we're willing to engage in. Um, so that could mean um, anything quite from low impact or high impact. But we are hoping that we see some sort of positive movement towards um, a solution into creating a charter for t- the 2024 season. Given your uh, long career in the game, what would you be pushing for if it came to that? Mm. <laughs> um, I don't know. Like I'm very, I suppose I'm very passionate about it, and I know people know me that way. Um, I don't know. I, I think we have to make a stand, and I'm and oh, I don't know. Like you could, there's numerous things you could do. You could um, have T-shirts. You could have a media blackout. You could have delay start times of games. Um, I suppose that's what Gaelic Games is all about. It's about essentially the players, and I understand that the volunteers behind the scenes probably without them it wouldn't run. We're not. It's not an us versus them, and I think that's something that's betrayed often. But we want to be part of the solution. But the NGBs aren't willing to get into a room with us and sort this out. Um, why, why not? Why aren't they? What, what's what is slowing this down? I don't really understand what the problem is. <laughs> yeah, your your guess is good as mine. Um, like, I, I from a personal point of view, that would have been an issue for me uh, playing Komogi. The lack of transparency into decisions. Um, you've we've all seen the news stories throughout the years, and you're wondering how do we come to to that decision? Nobody, you know, there's no there's a there's a huge lack of transparency. Um, I would feel. Um, I don't know why they won't get into a room and just figure it out. I don't know. Is it because well, it's if we meet, then there's a responsibility on us to do something, which is correct. There is a responsibility for them to do something. Um, like I'm seeing, there's lots of things on social media saying, and I've no problem addressing it. Well, the women don't generate as much money as the men. Like, I suppose there's loads of, arg- I have loads of arguments for that. You can look at it from like a business point of view. Um, That's a really idiotic capitalist bullshit argument. It's yeah. like, we don't treat you with respect yeah. because you're you're an economic unit. Like either everybody is a member of this, uh, the GA belongs to everybody except the women because they, they generate less money. Like, I'm sorry, but it's a moronic argument. No, exactly. Do you know? Yeah, like you, you can look at it from a business point of view if you're so obsessed with business and thinking sport is a business and like you don't start up a business and on day one go, why haven't I made any money yet? This is a joke. And that's the way it's been treated. There's also, in my opinion, like I understand that sport makes people money, but sport isn't business and it transcends that much much more greatly or whatever way you'd like to say it like you know when we're trying to entice uh, young girls and boys to play sport it's not for them to make us money um, so um, it's, it's it's a much much greater thing than that and if your scope is that um, like we've just said there about making money then you've lost the point of sport altogether well the hurlers don't um, make as much money as the footballers as we all know because there's way more football games so <laughs> stop paying the hurlers the same as the fo- you know it's just a stupid circular yeah, yeah, argument yeah. that yeah. Um, people who have no, no brain power can compute and yeah, it's, no, it's like, fundamentally sexist that's what it is we should just we should call it what it is mm. it's a boring sexist argument made by clowns would be my yeah. take on that yeah personally. I but think look if, if you ask someone walking down the street do you think uh, men and women who play for your county of Clare should get the same facilities the same treatment and it's a yes or no answer and if you would assume that most people um would say yes and then that's that's it that's that's where you go from there then right well how do we come up with solutions to that let's stop giving out how do we come up with solutions to that let's all figure that out instead of going well you're not in this group and you we're not under the same organization we're not doing that you don't do this like you know as you said yourself there's loads of words for it but if you think that men and women should be treated equally when they play for your county 
Yes. Then how do we come up with solutions? Let's get into room and figure that out. All right. Uh, last word to you, Maria, on this. What do you want to see happen next? And how quickly do you think something needs to happen? I think it needs to happen this week, to be honest. Um, we've all got championship games this weekend and, and like a lot of the girls alluded to yesterday being up in that hotel on a Monday morning the week of championship is not where any of us wanted to be um, but yet we have our first round of the All-Ireland Series this weekend our only home game in Tipperary and can't get Semple Stadium for it so you know it does drive you to go up to these places but at the same time you know Ladies Gaelic released a statement yesterday that didn't look overly promising and something that kind of annoyed me a little bit was that they were almost taken aback by the fact that women are stating that they're being treated like second class citizens but I'm saying read the facts the state of play report has been presented to you it's in front of you how can you say that we're not being treated as second class citizens when you look at the discrepancy between the two teams so to be honest with you given the statement that Ladies Gaelic put out and the Camogie Association I think we will see some form of protest this weekend all right. Well, we'll keep a very close eye on this. My thanks to Chloe Mori, Chloe Mori rather, and Maria Curley for joining us this morning. And best of luck with uh, the protest, whatever comes next. Hopefully, it won't lead to um, games being cancelled. But wherever this is going, it has to be done. So, thanks a million for joining us. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lance. It's uh, 9.32 this morning, OTBIM Live with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition is available now. There was some other news that we didn't get to this morning. Um, what, am I, what was I looking for? That I, was something specific that I meant to talk about. But you talk amongst yourself yeah. there, Adrian. I was, there was a very, while you're doing do, that, do your, um, there, was a, there was a very sad story from the TV last night. I was sat second row back from the front row and at halftime, just after halftime, the game was about five minutes old into the second half. There was a dad and son sat in front of me and they had gone off to get uh, chips and a Coke at halftime and they came back and you know the flip up seats obviously the little kid six, seven, eight direction goes sit down full punter of chips on the ground oh I just my heart broke from I just thought oh like because you know yourself kids it's the highlight of the a highlight of the evening for them particularly when they would be looking around the pitch up to that point um, so I thought oh well look the dad's got a full punter of chips so he'll share he'll, he'll just hand them over no not a bit of it. But well, how are you going to teach him a lesson, Adrian? Ah, oh, stop. The kid, I'd say, got about four or five little chips out of their little, little punnet. I just thought, I nearly felt like I'd go up and get you a punnet of chips myself. Like, give the kid the chips. Do, would you give the, I think yeah. this is a full dad cast said, out here. I, I, it could have been... Oh, don't worry, son. You, it, might, it might have been the wrong life lesson, but I couldn't have done anything else other than said, listen, I'll take three or four of them, but you just take that. Um, Sad little scene. Yeah. Uh, so obviously yesterday a completely different um, sorry to uh, lower the tone a little bit but Ireland were playing another 21 game against Kuwait yesterday and we walked off leading 3-0 with about 70 minutes gone I think and um, there was a report that this was as a result of racist comments that were made by a player uh, or staff member from the Kuwait team to one of our players. Uh, the Kuwaiti FA have issued a statement subsequently to say this isn't true, that um, we'd ended up getting having that um, match was cancelled to protect the players from injuries. So we're going to follow that story and come back to it a little bit later. But one of the big stars of yesterday pre-match was um, when Ashing O'Reilly stopped what she thought was just a randomer on the street to ask for an opinion about Stephen Kenny's Ireland. It turned out it wasn't any randomer. It was Don DC, who was a, a legend around uh, Galway football circles, whose brother is a legendary uh, winner of a league and European Cup with Aston Villa, Chick DC. And I'm delighted to say Don is with us this morning to take a lap of honour. Don, how are you? Newfound celebrity. Oh, oh, oh the crack. Oh, the crack. What are you oh, stop. It was great crack. Great crack. I had, no, I had uh, an idea who she was. And she said she wanted to interview me. And I said, could I have your phone number? And she said, no fucking way. No way, brother. No way. So I said, all right. But you see, I had a few fines on me. And I was with the chairman of Galway and I said, Jonathan Carver. And she stopped him first, you see. And then he pointed to me. And then she asked me about Stephen Kinney. So, look, it was only a bit of crack and a bit of a laugh. And, and that's all, really, you know. So I was just praying. Right, that we wouldn't lose. So by half time, it was nil nil, and there was an awful lot of people looking at me in the stadium and pointing to me. And I'm not on TikTok or any of that shit, you see. So I said, I better go and have a pint. And I was out, I had, I was thinking a pint, and this guy came up to me, and he looked at me, and he looked again, 
And I said, I haven't got the car with me, and I have insurance and tax. And it's not MTT, but it's MTT, exactly. No, he said, you're very familiar. I said, I hope you didn't see me on the wanted poster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I seen you on my phone, he said. I said, oh, yeah. I've been bringing out the DVD for Christmas, so will you leave me alone and let me drink the pipe and comfort? <laughs> <laughs> wow, so it swept it uh, uh, by half time. People were coming up and stopping you, haven't seen I you. I swear to God, yeah. And there was even this woman came up and she was uh, over from Birmingham in England. And she said, Could I buy you a drink? I said, You can, of course, anytime you want. And I, 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 she was an elderly woman, man, not fucking young herself. But I had great old crack with her, you know. She said, I've seen your thing. And Jonathan's son was with us, a lovely, lovely young lad called Reen. And it was his birthday. And I said, Reen, what did you ask for your birthday? He said, I asked my dad, Dad, would you bring me to the Irish game? I will, says his dad, which is Jonathan Corbin. And he said, there's one other request. Will you bring John with him? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it was the loveliest thing I heard. And he said to me, coming down in the car, John, he said, you have met my dear. Well, I said, Reen, I'm delighted that I met your dear, and I don't care about fucking anyone else. There you go. That's the God that is true. Uh, so uh, look, it was a great crack, and we were great for the laugh and everything. And I was out swimming this morning, out in Black Rock. You wouldn't believe it. And the amount of people passing in cars and blowing the horn and everything. And people that never spoke to me before would put, turn the other way we're fucking coming over shaking my hand. I said, Mother of Jesus, fucking hasn't things changed now? Mother of God. Did I? <laughs> and someone said to me, has, has your wife seen that video? And my wife rang me in the meantime, saying, and this is the God that is true. And she said, Dad, what? How do I turn on the television? Don't oh, mind the television. <laughs> I'll be home <laughs> So she hasn't seen it yet? He has not. Oh, well, there you go. You could be in trouble, Dan. You could be in trouble. Oh, well, I'm in trouble all my life. I stopped. I was walking up tall one day with her, and this will have stopped us. And my wife's a very quiet woman, you know, and she stopped us. And he said to her, are you married to that lunatic? And my wife turned around, and she said, I am, she said. Well, I'll tell you the truth, she said. He still makes me laugh, and especially in bed. <laughs> 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 I said to her, what do you mean by that? You're the best man I heard, heard talking about sex. She said, but you're fucking young for seven. <laughs> <laughs> We're all getting cancelled this morning. Don, come here. What about Stephen Kenny's 3 no win at the end? Uh-huh. Oh, fucking great. I could have kissed him. I could have kissed him. <laughs> I'd have been shocked at the last. I wouldn't go out in the second half. I stayed in blinking the pipes. I, I heard the roar. I said, oh, Jesus, thank God. Oh, stop. Dan, if the call comes in, for, if he if he asks you in to come in and give the team a bit of a G up, it sounds like you might be the right man for the job. You'd be up for it, would you? Uh, look, he's a good man and he's an honest man. And I think he is. A lot of people are like, but I fucking find him good. You know, and he's Irish. Not that I've seen that and buy that now. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> but he's one of our own. Exactly. Yeah, fucking hell, you know, and the man is trying his best. I don't think he has the talent for Sasha. Well, of us. Look, it's a bit of crack and we're calling it, you know, like this. And that's, a, that's what it's all about. Fuck it, if we can have a laugh a day, wouldn't it be great? Yes, <laughs> good stuff. Don, congratulations on your uh, celebrity status. It's well deserved. <laughs> Thanks a million for joining us. Uh, good morning to you. It's uh, Don DC there. Oh. Unique. <laughs> Our bleep, our bleep button is, uh, is worn out out there. Yeah, sorry, it didn't work. It, it, it failed us. Uh, right, on tomorrow's show, Tommy Rooney's power rankings. Very, very uh, controversy, uh, con- controversial coming up tomorrow. Uh, Longford manager Paddy Christie reflects on their season. We've got hurling in the wake of the news that um, Limerick are going to be without their captain, certainly for the semi-final, potentially for the final as well. The return of Brendan Rodgers to Celtic, plus plenty more besides. Right now, Stewie Burns' post-match reaction at the Aviva last night. Have a terrific Tuesday. Yeah, that was Evan Ferguson on the hour mark with Ireland's second. Mikey Johnston on 52 minutes open the scoring. Adam Ida in the 92nd minute put a sheen on the scoreboard. We mentioned pre-game that Greece had beaten Gibraltar 3-0. The Netherlands had beaten Gibraltar 3-0. France had beaten them 3-0. 
and now Ireland have repeated the tricks. Chewie Byrne was on commentary alongside Nathan. Game of two halves. Yeah. Thank God the second half was better. Yeah. Um, and thank God we were able to spot the, the issues that we were having in that first half. Um, frustrating that we had to wait till half time to do that. Um, but let's take the positive force. Acknowledge it was a big, big issue in the first half. Just couldn't break this, that Gibraltar team down. But, you know, playing against what it was a very, very basic international team. Probably, I agree with you, probably the poorest team I've ever seen come here. Um, I won't go into too much detail, but they were awful, to be quite honest. Um, so, very frustrating that we couldn't in the first half kind of noticed that and see that we were being a little bit too predictable constantly going down the wings just pulling back uh, predictable crosses into areas where there was any, anything from five, six white shorts just constantly blocking it um, you don't mind trying that early on but when it just becomes monotonous and predictable <laughs> you need to change something like you know so as the, the first half went on it got very frustrating um, and I thought um that dynamic in the first half was also frustrating because there were four, sometimes five, sometimes even six Irish players in the box, which on the face of it is um, attacking and, 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 and you know, uh, trying to uh, do the right thing. But they seemed to arrive so early that they were all just stationary in the box. Nobody was arriving late or timing a run. There was a degree of, look at us, we're all in the box and you guys have loads of space in the two flanks. We'll just wait for you to cross it in. Yeah. So not many players were attacking the ball and it was just a very stagnant. That comes from the result. fact that when you're constantly just rotating the ball left, central, right, central, left, the players just park themselves in the middle. Yeah. And even the attacking Irish players are parked in there in the middle. Ultimately, you want to be able to come onto the ball as you break, get in behind, get in behind the defence. So what you got, what you got to do in those situations, you got to, you have, you got to have players in your team that can get on it centrally and probe balls centrally. We spoke about it at half time, um, and we, you know we 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 we, we spoke with West Hula the likes of a. Jackborn or whatever the case may be try and bang it into Evan Ferguson bang it in, into Obafemi and draw those players that are static the defenders draw them out of their position you know and it, it it's not what they're expecting and you know, everything else is predictable and you know you're getting really frustrated looking at this I mean, we're, we're speaking at half time you've got to get you've got to, you've got to have players in the pitch that can notice this and need to demand that of either of themselves or of somebody else or maybe the skipper of the team get on to Josh Crow and say Josh you know bang a few into Evan or and you could see that Evan Ferguson loves to do that he loves to come deep and get on it and get torn did it in the second half but he didn't he didn't know when to do it in the first because he didn't because he didn't know when he doesn't know when the ball's coming to him he'll take it all day you know but he doesn't know when it's when he's going to get it that point you make about demanding it of each other yeah I, 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 I mean some teams have it subliminally like they're on the same page right they, they work with each other's Man City all the top team Barcelona blah 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 they, they, they know when it's coming but sometimes, yeah, you have to kind of, you just have to get a bit aggressive with each other. You don't have to shout, just saying, give, give it to me. I want to hear. Yeah. Or if you're the player and the ball saying, I want you there, get in there. And you like, think I, we're a bit quiet, a bit passive. Just, we're just a bit quiet, like, you know. Now, credit where it's due, it came at half time, right? And it changed, and all of a sudden, Michael Johnson comes on, and bang, he's through the middle, and everything is happening. We get our two goals within 10, 12 minutes, and fair enough, but we're playing Gibraltar, Joe. They're awful. They were shocking. Yeah, they were the worst side I've seen at the They're awful. That's like a, that's like a, 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 a game you'd see behind closed doors where you have no game to play and you decide to play a lesser team. And it just needs to be better, more aggressive and just a little bit more inventive, you know? Yeah. So, slightly bigger picture. On the back of Athens, I think uh, certainly a fair quotient to people are turning if they haven't quite turned against Stephen Kenny they felt he was tactically outmaneuvered they felt three and a half years into his tenure and, and a, you know a lot of leeway given and a lot of patience new players brought in given caps that to be here in a Euros qualifier three and a half years in and produce, producing that in what was like the pivotal game of the campaign just wasn't good enough on a whole host of fronts and so that, that mood is bubbling I suspect you would advocate Stephen Kenny still very much being in charge in September for the trip to Paris and the Netherlands here in Dublin and, and go from there. But you sense the pressure that he's under. I'm sure you're talking to people. 
Yeah, I, I, well, look, you, you, I mean, you, you, you couldn't but avoid it after Friday's game. There's no doubt about it. I, I, I mean, I admit I was probably caught a little bit surprised by the by the backlash, um, but it's very hard to defend when um, you know when you look when you when you take into consideration the performance. And he come with you. I mean, look, not a huge amount has changed tonight. A bit better for the second half, but we've had of the of the 180 minutes of football. Or, you know, we've had 45. I wouldn't even say 45. Probably had maybe 20 decent. Ah, like tonight's of not football. Tonight is only decisive if Ireland had lost yeah. or if they had won 10 nil and played the best football we've ever seen. T- tonight changes nothing really. It's to what extent you read into Athens. So, well, where where are you on the Athens uh, spectrum? Oh, I think tactically we got it wrong. We, t- tactically we got it wrong. I, 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 I couldn't figure out what way we were playing the first ten minutes, especially when you, when, when you, when you, what really persuaded me. You got um, Alameda, Ferguson up front, two, two of top, and I see the likes of Josh Cullen or Jason Malumbi closing down a fullback. And that you got three or four players out of the game all of a sudden, and then you've got Smallbone has to come in central then to, to, to cover the holes, and Greece are just coming out. This is the first five minutes. I don't get that. I don't understand that. You're waiting home, playing against the top team. Um, you know, the, the basics are, are the basics. You got to you got to earn the right to uh, get yourself into a game. You got to make sure you don't do that silly force 15, 20 minutes. Grow into the game. All the all the stereotypes. They're all they, they exist for a reason. Yeah. Because they're true. You know. So. I don't know where that's gone wrong, but um, there's no doubt about it. Got it, com- got it, got it completely wrong. Um, Didn't change it overly quickly either. Waited till half time. Ireland were lucky to be one 0 Could have been three, four, one down. Yeah, I think my, I think the confidence might have been hit then. Might have been rocked because t- to, be, to be fair to Greece, Joe, they smelled blood. You know, and as soon as they said, as soon as they sensed, they, I think it was fifth, sixth minute. These aren't at it. We, and they just went through the gears, didn't they? And squeezed us, put us under pressure, um, and we, we 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 struggled with that, like you know. So we 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 just under Stephen's management, um, what we've benefited from his personality with younger players. Um, and bringing through younger players and giving younger players the confidence, we've lost. In ter- we've lost maybe aggression and the ability for players to maybe be a little bit more intuitive on the pitch, sense when things aren't happening. Maybe you know he's not a roaring and shouting. I don't see him down there roaring and shouting instructions and trying to you know change or getting onto a particular play and say get us doing this, get, whatever the case may be. So what we've gained. Um, in, in, in what his attributes are as a manager we've lost other stuff as well and I'm I'm uncomfortable with what we've lost I'm, I, I like aggression I don't mean aggression in going out and smashing somebody I mean aggression in terms of just being assertive with your with your, with your your teammate and saying need more out of you or, or sometimes players need to do that to get more out of themselves and you think that stems from him as opposed to just the natural personality I think that's, a, I think that's, an, I think that's an effect of his management style I do yeah I, I, I don't think he likes that as a manager um, and it's a hard thing it's a you know it's a, it's a hard thing to uh, uh, you know obviously it, it's it's nearly gone out of our game now, but you need a bit of that. So you know, I, I'm sensing you think we're a little bit too nice to play against. We're too, we've been we've been a little. We're too nice to each other. We're too nice to each other. I mean, even even the goal, even the silly goals we've conceded in some of the various games here, it's, it's you know you don't see any reaction from the players going. Maybe Seamus Coleman. You yeah. you you see McClain. from Seamus, yeah, Seamus and, and you know James McLean. You would have seen it from maybe, but that's it's going out of the game. And I keep hearing this. Oh, it's different. It's different. It's not different. You know, you go look at any. You go look at all the top players, top teams. They're all having a goal. Each other. Well, you know, they're, 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 it's not meant to be hurtful, or it's just it's meant to it's, get it the gives, best out of each other. It gives other. you that ten yeah. percent that yeah. you need, that edge. You just need that edge sometimes. That yeah. Ireland, in particular, have thrived yeah, on. I think we need aggression DNA. in our game, you know, yeah. because we're not the, we're we're not the best quality team in the world. Yeah. We're not we're not the best passing team in the world. Even though we're talking about you know being a more a passive football, fine, we're getting there. We're a, we're a long way off. Yeah. We need to get more aggression back into our game again. We need to fill those gaps. Yeah, not least the next two games against France and the Netherlands. We're pretty much out of time. Stewie, me and you, let's always be nice to each other. That said, yeah, so. less yeah. aggression out of you. Yeah. You know, just keep uh, it good. Side. Thank you so much for coming this evening. Thanks, Appreciate- yeah.
AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition available now.